Wake up. It's time for Primal Scream. Hey, welcome back to the Primal Scream. I'm Matt. And I am Todd. And it is November sh- every time, every fucking time. <laughs> That's okay, buddy. It's the ninth. It's the tenth. It's the tenth. A for I was effort. one, I was A one for effort. You were very, very close. And tomorrow is Veterans Day. Yeah. That's kind of cool. That's kind of neat. Do you think we treat our veterans? Do you think? I mean, we have a holiday, but we also have Martin Luther King Day. But uh, people don't really treat. I don't think a holiday is. I don't think a holiday is necessarily a good. I mean, I think it's good to make sure you think about things and recognize people. That's right. what holidays are for. But sure. were you going to say? Do you think we we treat the veterans well? I mean, do you? I, it's 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 almost insulting. I, a I, in, in a way, in a way, it's almost insulting. It's like, hey, no, man, fuck, we gave you a holiday. What else do you want? Healthcare? No, <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> you want to be able to actually submit your claims? Exactly. Fuck off. You got a holiday. Yeah. So when people are like, hey, you want your veterans discount? You know what? It's a little, I mean, I, your heart's probably in the right place, right. but it's really, it just kind of irritates me. I guess, I, I think it's a good thing to have a holiday to recognize people, not just from, I, our focus is on people now, but, you know, to think about people who came before World War I, World War II, and Korea, and Vietnam, and things like that. Well, I, think it's, I think it's important to remember that we have been, we have had a lot of people that have, whether you agree with any of those wars at all, right? we had a lot of people that were willing to volunteer to do those things. And that alone, to me, is a pretty amazing thing. I mean... You have issues with the military. A lot of people do. Right. But, but yeah. Junior's in it. You were in it. People we know have been in it. Rock and, and Nick. And I just think it's somebody who was willing to say, you know what? I'm going to go do this. You know, and with the right intentions. And even if at some point you disagree with it, somebody yeah. still went and did something. So I think, that, I think it's okay to have a holiday. But I do think it is a little, a little odd that we have a holiday, but yet we don't have them taken care of. So, hey, we're all going to wear camouflage you know, football hat, you know, baseball caps that have, you know, our favorite team on it, their camo, though, because it's Veterans Day and they wore them all day today on the NFL. That's, and yet we don't, see, and yet that's we don't the type have, of thing that really annoys me. Yeah. Instead of, because it comes off as insincere, it comes off as just marketing, it comes off as just capitalist, capitalism, which I'm all for capitalism, I'm all for making money, but don't, don't take something that should be, hey, thank you sincerely thank you for your sacrifice thank you for donating your time of your life which is precious exactly to do something that that's to volunteer to have somebody tell you to do something and you're hoping in the deepest part of your heart <laughs> that it is an honorable thing that they're right. asking you to do exactly. and to achieve and they're also telling you that you have to follow those orders so yeah, that's and, the way it goes. yeah and thank you for dealing with all of that anxiety, all of that, um, all of those horrible things that you might have seen, the friends that you might have lost, there's a, there's a deep sincerity that I have for veterans sure. in that regard. And it, and it bugs me when... You see a, s- a, a baseball cap with your favorite yeah. team on it. It's camo for Veterans Day. Well, it's like... It's, it's like it, it reminds I have an issue with the NFL, period. Like- it's, it's an issue with the NFL, period, that they all become... It's like they were, they were wearing pink three or four weeks ago. Everything was fucking pink that they had on for breast cancer. Right. But is yeah. it... I mean, is it just important that the NFL is making things people aware of things? Or is it now just a marketing tool? You know what I mean? So, I don't know. And, and to know that it seems disingenuous as well that we, you know, wear a baseball cap that's camouflaged in honor of these people, and yet we still, why don't, why don't the NFL make a, a $1 billion donation to some new group who can make sure all the veterans' claims get put on a computer so we all know what the fuck's going on? Right. You know, just something simple and a little bit less, disin- it, it seems disingenuous to me sometimes, but... Have you noticed what I put on the, on the website? No, I haven't been on the website for, for a while. For those of you who have I shouldn't say that out loud, visited, <laughs> well, I mean, you're here... You're here helping me do the podcast, and my thing is the website. Your thing is tweeting, and you're yes. doing a fucking great job tweeting, well, thanks, Appreciate mister. That. But something that I added to the website recently, which is it does coincide a little bit with Veterans Day, but I really didn't mean for it to. It just I, I just finally got around to doing it. It was something that I, I believe in. It's something that I um, promote, and that is... The Wounded Warrior Project. 
So uh, on, our, on our front page of our website, you'll see kind of rotating images on there. You have the gorilla, you have the primal scream. You can click on that, it'll take you to our podcast, our recent podcast. There's also uh, a great, great author. His book flashes on there, Within. And then you'll see a banner, and you can click that and go to my friend Aaron Bunce's website, which he a wonderful book, and he does a really kick-ass blog. So read his blog. And then you'll see the Wounded Warrior uh, picture, and you click on that, and it'll take you right to the Wounded Warrior Project, where you can make a donation. You can see what you can do in your area for veterans. So awesome. that's just one addition I've made recently. I like it. Yeah. Well, any other, anything off the top of your head for recent events? I did see one thing that I was going to tell you about, that atheists are starting to have their own mega churches. And I, this is terrible, but I, I've always <laughs> kind of, it's not terrible that people have atheist mega churches. It's terrible, the thing I'm going to say, which is I've always had this weird feeling when I see a church, like in, I saw a church in Dallas one time with like, 15,000 people in it. A lot of fucking people. (laughs) No, I'm like literally like tens of thousands of people can fit in this one stadium-like church. It is enormous. It is enormous. And, you know, and everybody is talking in tongues and waving hands and it's almost like, so. this is bad. It's almost like a a, a form of like mass hysteria in my mind. It's like all people, yeah. everybody in one mindset, and everybody's like, oh, we get, you know, it's like, I just, it, those big, huge group things always kind of, they're a little too much, you know, Jones kind of things <laughs> for me. You know, everybody drinks the cool Jonestown? Aid. It's just a little too scary. And so the idea that atheists <laughs> all get to a mega church, what are they going to talk about? To me, you know, when you have a church, it's like, it's Jesus Christ. I mean, that's all you talk about. That's, that's the Trinity. That's it. Boom. What he's done for you, saved you, however you changed your life. That, to me, is a focal point for a megachurch. So <laughs> there's no focal point for an atheist. Well, no, no, no. What are you going to talk about well, an atheist megachurch? Well, that's what we would assume. We would assume that there yeah. is nothing right. for it's them to talk about. There's a huge assumption. There's a huge assumption. But here's another assumption, because I'm a skeptical asshole. Yeah, I'm with you. Which is... If you have a religion, does that religion have to pay taxes? Ooh, an atheist church would have to pay taxes, would they? Bing! Oh, that's what I mean. Immediately, that's what I come. I come out at. Oh, so, what would you get? You want to make sure you have good donuts on Sunday, and you get together. <laughs> make, I mean, what do you? No, I, I have no idea. But go to? this is the thing that annoys. This is the, the only thing that annoys. I shouldn't say the only thing. One of my biggest pet peeves about religion in this country yeah. is that. They don't, they've turned into this, it, it, it has changed from your local church on down block who the minister knows everyone's names and there's a, there's a wonderful fellowship in oh, the church. Oh, and you talked about how much we liked that at the church we went to. Yeah, the fellowship was, was huge. Because it was small and we knew, everybody knew us and we knew everybody and it just felt like a big family. Yeah. You turn these things that should be intimate like the small churches, you turn something like that into mega churches, you lose something that was priceless. And that's the, that family type atmosphere. And you've turned it, yeah, and you've turned it into a super Walmart. That's all you've done. You've turned it into a super Walmart. For Jesus. For Jesus. And whoever that donation is going to, they're getting fucking filthy rich. They're getting filthy fucking rich. And you might think that your donations are going to go to the needy or the poor or some village in South Africa. But that minister, whoever is running that church, is making a shit ton of money. I'm guessing. I'm guessing. I think a lot of the times they get so pop- that's my opinion. They get super popular as ministers. And so that's when they start writing books and things like that. And I think they probably, I would say they probably get wealthier for the things they do outside the church. They're living pretty high on the hog while they are ministering right. that church. Because even if they're not taking a salary, I mean, this is one of the things that I smelled bullshit really strongly at our last church was, hey, I don't take a salary. Oh, you don't? No, but the church is building me a new house. The church is building me a brand new house right next to the brand new church that we're going to be building so I can be close to it. Okay, so 
fuck, dude, they're not, they're providing you food, they're, pro- they're paying all your bills, and you have a beautiful fucking house. You're living, I mean, that's, that's, the, okay. epi- that's the epitome of what we all want. Right. We all want a beautiful house <clears throat> that we don't have to worry about our bills. We all want to have food to be able to feed our kids and not have to worry about that stuff. We all want that. So make no mistake, even if some of these people are saying, well, we don't get a very big salary, you are the man You're in charge paid. of this huge church, and you are being treated like a fucking rock star. And I don't remember any rock star going around in tattered jeans unable to feed themselves. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. I that's, just think it was interesting that, you know, when I, 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 my idea of a mega church, you know, is, is, so, is so different that I just I think of an atheist church. And, or, and, and, I mean, that's, they said atheist mega church, and so I was like, it's kind of a contradiction. You know, in and of itself. You know what? I'm, I really don't God understand. Kind of I really don't understand truly the definition of atheism. Or is it? I, I mean, I understand people that they they don't believe in religion, right? And right. I and I do believe. I I think I understand that is what atheism is. Oh, I'm sorry, agnostic. That's the that's the one that I'm really confused about. Agnostic is the. the I think it's a belief in God, but it's not a belief in Jesus Christ as the one. I think that's what it is. You know what? We don't know. We don't know. We could Google it real quick, but then that would take us away from the podcast. <laughs> and then you guys would just be like, come on, dude, fucking talk. Start swearing. I, I, I downloaded this podcast so you'd be fucking talking, not hearing. <laughs> All right. Well, I did. I, I'm, I'm fast. So the, I, the, an agnostic is a person who believes this is a uh, boy, oh boy. This is Google's definition. So a person who believes that nothing is known or can be known of the ex- existence or nature of God or anything beyond material phenomenon, a person who claims neither faith nor disbelief in God. So you're not saying that there is no God, but you're not maybe saying that, that we're, there maybe is. Maybe we're agnostic. Well, I'm not the, saying there isn't a God, well, and I'm not saying that there is a God. What's the, what's athe, well, then what's atheism? Atheism is saying, I, I believe atheists, from the definition of Matt, atheism is there is nothing. It's not that I can't prove that there's nothing. There is nothing. Well, an atheist is a person who disbelieves or lacks belief in the existence of God or gods. Period. Isn't that the same thing? No, as agnostic. Just read? Agnostic is just saying I can't prove it, but I can't disprove it either. So I'm, in the I'm not hating. I'm in the middle. I'm just saying I, don't, I can't prove it or disprove it. I'm not saying that you're wrong or you're right. I'm in the middle. I'm on the fence. That's so how I guess, I guess so that's I guess, how it is. Agnostic is you're on the fence. Atheist is on the left side of the fence going, no. Done. Done. There's nothing There's on nothing the other side of the there. fence. Okay. Nothing. And then the religious people are on the, the other yeah. side of the so fence. So they neither claim a belief or, or, dis, or disbelief. Correct. They just don't. You, huh. cannot, you cannot that is convince a little, me that is either a, way. That is a little on the fence. I think either guy should get out the pot. I mean, no, what, no. no? You, you can't convince me either way. Oh, because it, it they, want, they want physical proof. They want to be shown to the proof of it. Prove period. to me that okay. it does not exist. Prove well, to would, me it doesn't exist. Sam, or prove to me that it does. Is Sam Harris an atheist? Then he said he just doesn't believe. Period. Right? Isn't he an atheist? No, I don't think. I don't. Again, I don't want to put words in his mouth. I have no idea what I've what I have heard him say, or what I've. I shouldn't say that. I, I, let me back up. What I've heard other people say about his belief system is. He's not religious, but he's spiritual. So in a way, I would think that he's agnostic because nobody has proven to him that these spiritual beliefs are true. But then again, he leaves himself open to the fact that they, there might be something else out there. Right. He just doesn't see it. Well, yet. it says that he, although an atheist, he avoids using the term and argues against labeling. One way or the other. Okay, so let's not label them. Okay, we won't label Fine. them. Fine. Sam, you can be <laughs> Sam, you can be whatever you want, buddy. You can be however wait, you want. By the way, hmm. his recent podcast with Joe Rogan, I was really let down. Really? Really. I thought that he he wasn't quite as concise as he usually is when he talks because Joe Rogan argue with him a lot more this time oh, yes, than, he did. The, than the the last time he was yes, on. Yes he did. But I I still thought it was a good discussion. But you're right. He wasn't as, uh, you know what? I mean, maybe you can had, have a good discussion, which is polite maybe and it can go back and forth. But you don't, you, you, when people start 
him hawing around and trying to find the exact perfect word to prove their point, and yet their point is still so muddied and convoluted because they're using non-regular speech tactics. Right. Like, the normal person would say, dude, why are you talking like a lawyer? (laughs) Why are you using lawyer speak in this government bill? Why can't you just spell it out in layman's terms? I felt a little confused by that conversation. So Joe Rogan is, and this is what I really like about Joe Rogan, and, and if there is anybody, I don't know if there's anybody out there who hasn't heard the name Joe Rogan, but if you haven't, Great podcast. We have a link on his, uh, to his podcast on our website, theprimalscream.org. <laughs> and you can check out his stuff. But his recent podcast with Sam Harris, he, he, he argues with him back and forth. And he catches Sam. He's like, no, how can you have that? You're saying that there is an evil. And Sam Harris is like, well, no. I, it really made me feel like Joe Rogan caught him. He caught him. Right. And he was trying to use Sam Harris's logic, not against him, but he was trying to use Sam Harris's logic in reference to government. Right. And Sam Harris was like, what I think was happening was Sam Harris was like, oh, fuck, I'm in mental jujitsu right now. <laughs> I got to figure out a way to not put myself into this position to right. where somebody can quote me later as saying the government is evil. So he was trying to backpedal and and squirm out of it and get out of Joe's guard. Right. <laughs> I'm so term. I'm so into jujitsu right now. I'm so into oh, the idea God. of jujitsu right now. I just I'm obsessed. So I am. Yeah. So for those of you who are not obsessed with jujitsu, I'll get off that subject <laughs> and we'll move on. Yeah. It was. It. I thought it wasn't as good a discussion as they'd had in the past, but. I still thought they brought up a lot of good ideas. And I, 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 again, I like Joe Rogan's take on things because it's from a point of view that I would be kind of questioning things. It's kind of from like that, you know, not the most educated person in all the areas, but trying to wrap their heads around it, trying to have some understanding of it. And he was talking to him like, oh, wait, you said this. And so I'm, I'm, I really want to figure this out. I want to understand. So tell me again how the, you're talking about this. Well, doesn't that go along with what you said a little bit ago about this? And doesn't that right. apply the same way? Right. I like that he's questioning now, things. Did, that, and did that remind you of anything? I don't know. Did it, like who? Like How about you and me? Oh. How about you and I at <laughs> Bible study? Oh. And we would, they would start the Bible study out, and they would read something at the beginning of a chapter or a verse, and we'd get to the end, and it would say something completely different. And you and I would bring up these questions. Well, doesn't this contradict what he said at the beginning? Mm-hmm. Or doesn't this contradict what he said at the end? And oh, what was, it, what was the standard answer? You're just babies in the religion. Oh, you're just babies. Fuck, you're just babies in the religion. So crazy. That yeah, that's the thing that, and, and it's a common thing to me. That's a common frustration in any in any debate, whether it's. Joe Rogan with Sam Harris, whether it's us with our old Bible study group, it's when people look, basically, they look down on you. Right, that's part of they it. They look down, down their down nose you. at you like you're an infant, and then they try to word things in such a tangled mess that you think to yourself, oh, am I so stupid I can't understand what they're saying exactly? Yeah, what's wrong or with are me? they Why talking in a in a sentence knot. Have they just talked themselves into a big knot and I can't untie this fucking knot. So I must be stupid. They must know what they're talking about because I can't follow what they're saying. Yeah. And I, and I really felt like when I was listening to Joe Rogan, listen to just Sam Harris, I got that, that feeling really strong. Like what the fuck is Sam Harris? What, what is he trying to describe? no, Joe has it right. He just you just, just said it. He just said it back to him, and he just he just applied this these things. He just changed the labels a little bit. Right. Well, I just part of me gives. I kind of give everybody kind of a pass sometimes. You know, maybe he was having a shitty day. Maybe he was off his game. Maybe he wasn't prepared. True. You know, we've all been but, there. I mean, it's like I was after Rock being on last week. I've been reading more about Ron Paul and some of that stuff. Just kind of just looking into it more. And then I and then I bumped into he um he backed uh Ken Cuccinelli for Virginia. He was a Republic, Republican running for Virginia. And okay. there was and there was an independent 
guy running for Virginia, but he, Ron Paul didn't back the Republican, the, I'm sorry, there was a libertarian guy running for Virginia, but he was a little bit more moderate, liberal, I guess, and so Ron Paul backed the Republican guy, and this is a guy who wanted to put into law that sodomy is illegal, blowjobs are illegal, that sex is just for... The libertarian or the no, Republican? the Republican that Ron Paul backed okay. was for you know, intervaginal things before you get abortions, was for, again, anti, anti, anti-sex laws because sex is for procreation. He's a huge born in Christian. It's for procreation, not for enjoyment or having a good time at all for any reason. Really, kind, I mean, really fucking right-wing social ideas. And again, that's a, that's a little tick in my notch for me with Ron Paul. I don't want, I, he, if he is a libertarian for social issues, right? And it sounds like he is. You can do whatever the hell you want in, your own, in the privacy of your own bedroom. We're not going to pass laws about it. Mm-hmm. That makes sense to me. Right. Um, everybody is, has the liberty to have and freedom to do what they want to do. Then don't back a Republican governor or a guy running for governor who is an anti you know, I'm going to put into a law that you can't get a fucking blowjob. Or I'm going to put into a law that, guess what? You know, you don't get pregnant? You have anal sex instead? Well, it's illegal now. I mean, talk about personal might, freedoms and liberties. You might, you might as well put a law or keep in law the fact that a husband can beat a wife on Sunday as long as it's on the courtroom steps. Right. Yeah. Something stupid. like I mean, that, that is actually a law somewhere. It is. And I think it's, it's ridiculous. Well, and I, just, I think it, and he also wanted to ban people getting divorced unless it was for certain specific things. Like you can't get a divorce unless these things are happening or these things have taken place. Right. And then you can get a divorce. Well, again, there's another personal liberty and freedom that you're infringing on somebody else. Yeah. So that kind of bothered me. Again, I'm not going to dismiss Ron Paul. I still think he, I think I probably might personally kind of follow along a lot of the lines he does. His interventionist stuff I think is, is a good thing. Um, his, you know, Anti-Fed stuff is a good thing. I just need to do more research. I'm not all lock and barrel because I've gotten burned by too many politicians at this point. I don't. Yeah, believe, I, mean, I don't believe be anybody. It's trust, like I don't. You believe know, it's one of those anybody. things uh, that I heard at a um, trust but verify. Trust but verify. Yeah, it was. I my wife and I did a a parenting class. It was a class on drug use. Actually, like huh. this is the different drugs that are out there right now. This is how kids are using the drugs right now. This is what you need to look for. These are the signs. These are the symptoms. This is how to be a parent. You trust them. Hey, Dad. Hey, Mom. I'm going to go with my friends to the school, and we're going to play basketball. All right. Trust them, but verify. Every now and then, you drive past the school, yep, and then check in. Hey, I don't want you to feel like I'm checking up on you, but... I knew you'd, I knew you'd be doing the right thing. I just want to know what you wanted for dinner. I mean, I mean, you you go you let your kids see you oh. verify that they are doing the right thing, and you give them a pat on the back right in front of their friends. And it's like, <laughs> and also at that point, as a kid, you're like, I never know when my fucking dad's going to show up. <laughs> right. I have to be doing the right thing because well, I never know when you my and dad's I talk, fucking we, we show up. We were talking about the the Gracie's kids jujitsu, you know, oh. bully proof thing. So right. I, I think of but think of that though. If you're instilling the right things in your kid, that they trust you, they know you love them unconditionally, they know you have their back. If you have all those things built into it, hopefully, and if you so, if you reinforce that part, and then you still do the part you just talked about, which is, hey, you're going to be here, and you, hey, what do you want for dinner? Those kind of things. Mm-hmm. The kid's not going to. I don't think the kid will be thinking of it as, oh fuck, I'm never going to get off underneath this guy's thumb. He's going to be thinking, that's my dad. We do all kinds of things together. He loves, right. he cares about me, he's going to keep an eye on me, he's going to make sure I'm safe all the time. Right. I, don't, I think you can avoid even the idea of your kid going, fuck, I'm under the, always under the microscope, I can never get away from these people. It's going to be more of like, well, oh, that's just what my dad does. My dad does that because he cares about me and loves me, and it's not even a, a, a thought. As long, you know? as, you, as long as you can get that message across to your child in a constructive right. way. Not, well, the other day, this was a, it was a, it was fun, kind of a funny story. My, my kids get off the bus the other day. I'm at home. They come through the door. First, my middle son is the first kid through the door. And the first thing that he says is he's pouting. He's pouting. And the first thing that comes out of his pouty little mouth is, my brother was hitting me. So his little brother was teasing him or hitting him or something. He's pouting about how his little brother was treating him on the bus. So I go, okay, buddy. Well, I'm sorry that he did that to you. 
But when he gets in here, I'm going to ask him what was going on. He goes, oh, okay. He's still pouting. So the little brother comes in. My, son, my youngest son comes in. And I go, hey, what's going on? Were you hitting him on the bus? Yeah. And he starts bawling immediately, just sobbing. My youngest, sobbing. And right as soon as he started sobbing, my middle son, who came in with, uh, with these allegations, my middle son steps in between us, steps between me and the youngest son, and he goes, Dad, Dad, um, I'm going to tell you the truth. So you said if we tell you the truth, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be mad, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the truth. <laughs> and I really, I mean, I really had to rein in the anger. Your frustration. The frustration. Sure. Because, uh, but I did. I reined it in. I smiled and I said, okay, bud, just what happened? Just tell me the truth. He goes, I, I slammed his head into the side of the bus. And I go, what? <laughs> And, and my youngest son is crying even harder now. He wasn't crying when he came through the door. But now that we're, we're addressing talking something we're talking about, now he's bawling his, his eyes out. And so I feel his head. There is a goose egg on this boy's head like you won't believe. And I go, okay. So, I mean, it's one of those things. You have to demonstrate that I'm here. It's one of those things I've been trying to instill in my kids. So it was one of those. It was one of those moments where I was really proud, proud yeah, of the be. fact that my son got it in his head. If I just tell my dad the truth now, before right. he has to start digging, before he has to start <laughs> investigating, right. if he doesn't have to put his investigative hat on, and I tell him the truth now, things will be so much better for me. Right. So I knew that this was one of those pivotal moments that it's either going to make or break this type of thing with, with my, my oldest boy. It's so hard to control those emotions, though, because it's so frustrating. I mean, it's just Yeah, because so... you have a physical injury over here, and you right. want to validate. I wanted to validate my younger son and be like, I'll protect you. I love you. Your feelings are as important to me as your older brother's. And so, I mean, part of me thinks that, you know, this is hindsight, it's 2020, so that you do that. You hug him, you kiss him, you validate it and let him know, and then you turn around the other one and you talk about being disappointed because, you know, thank you for being honest with me. I really appreciate it, but yeah. you know better yeah, than that. Yeah, that's actually and exactly then, what and I And then did. slap him really hard. <laughs> no, I did not no? slap <laughs> Oh, I'm so, Oh, I'm off. I'm off. I'm sorry. I'm, no, I'm not sorry. that You're day. Right. Okay. Not that day. <laughs> Um, there's not much else in the news besides. Oh, that's that's not true. You know, what? I have not looked at enough stuff in the news recently. But yeah. right now, things are kind of slowly calming down since the Obamacare is fizzling slowly away in the media, so to speak. Do you think it's fizzling away, or have people just gotten so sick of it? I mean, after well, a while, you can only bitch about something for so long, right? I mean, it's after a while, nobody wants to happen, know about like Janet Jackson's not. boob either. Exactly. No, I think that's part of it. I think it's just getting old. You can keep talking about it. It's the law. The law of the land. It's going to happen. Everybody can bitch no. about it. It's the way it goes. We got to wait. Shit. We got to wait and deal with it. Back to what you were saying about Ron Paul. Something I wanted to yeah. talk about real quick. And for, I, and, for, and for Rock, when he listens to this, I'm not just dissing on Ron Paul. I just want to, I just want to, to me, it's okay because you know what? You were actually if, getting really, really convinced. You were actually getting sucked into the Ron Paul thing because you were very anti. I still am. I'm still, I, I, he is still skeptical. appealing to me. But you're skeptical. It's skeptical. And then, and then that's okay for me because the hard part is that when Rock talks about him, it's, you know, all roses, right? Oh, sure. It's very and, rosy. Yeah, but. The guy, he's, he's a human being, and he probably has some flaws. Now, if his flaws are things that don't affect me policy-wise, like, like Anthony Weiner, so be it. That's fine with me, too. I don't give a shit if he, like, if he uh, tweets Bill his Clinton cock to people. getting a blowjob under the desk? Yeah. Who fucking cares? Exactly. So if that's what that is, if that's just, you know. But again, if I'm going to believe him that he's always made the right choice, always made the right decision, those kind of things, and then he backs a douchebag like this, it makes me go... What the fuck? Why would you not back okay. a libertarian? But this is, this is what I wanted to get to. Yeah. This was my point. Have you ever backed the wrong horse? Mm. Me personally. Oh, hell yes. You're right. Me personally, the, there's, there's people that I work with, and I try to get along with everybody. There's, there's certain people that everyone dislikes. The mass majority dislike certain people. 
okay, that sure. I work with. And then the, the, the reasons for why they dislike them, they tell me. And then the most popular people that I work with, who everyone loves, they commit those crimes Same thing. to the 10th degree. They do the things that people said, hey, you know that one guy? He's such a piece of shit. I fucking hate him. I wish he wouldn't come back to work. He's, such, he's, he's a terrible person. He ruins this. He ruins that. And then the popular <laughs> and, person. And then the popular person comes in, and you're like, hey, you just did everything that that other guy did, but we all love you. Huh. But why is that? Why is it? Why is it? Why is there a person that I know Double who standard. has who has terrible traits? Terrible traits. Horrible work ethic. Lies. Uh, lets people down. Never shows on time. And I instinctively want to be his friend. What does that say about me? Right. What does that say about all of us? I mean, there's there's a lot of times where I back the wrong horse. You know, right. and there's a lot of times where people they think they're using logic, but they're being so hypocritical. Right. That oh, I hate that guy because he 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 makes work go so slow. Look at your best friend. What's your best friend doing right now? Oh, well, he's at the cafeteria getting stuff to eat. Okay, and he's probably been there for a half hour. So your best friend is. Twice as bad right. as this other guy who you demonize. So why are you demonizing him truly? Right. Is it because he's not in union? Is it because he is a, a total fist fuck socially? Right. Uh, is is it the, is it because your best friend is just hilarious? He walks into the room and he could say the most mundane thing, and everyone is rolling because he has that type of personality. Sure. Yeah. He says things in such a way that you're just like, oh, fuck, you are killing me. You are killing me, Gary. <laughs> Gary. <laughs> nice name. <laughs> well, that's actually, a, that's actually a, a goofy inside joke between me and that guy. That's not his real name. But uh, I actually call him that because he calls me a different name and not my actual name. And he's been doing that since day one. Oh, okay. Since I, we've been working together. I, I, I guess... Again, I I, I want to investigate more, but and and I might give him a pass. But again, backing the wrong horse and then making a political decision because you want a Republican to be in there, and maybe he's doing what a lot of people should do when it comes to politics is, um, you know, Chris Christie when he won uh, New Jersey last week, he said, um, you know, in some interview I forget who he was with, but he said, no, you know, yes, people think that. People decide on a politician. They take it, make it, they make a list, and it's the pros on one side and the cons on the other side. And they decide whoever has more. He's like, people don't vote like that. Chris Christie said they vote with their gut. They vote with what, who they think is going to make the best choice for them, sure. even if they don't politically follow him. Because he got a huge he won by shit, a landslide, twenty didn't he? points, which includes more Democrats, more Independents, and more Libertarians. And so it was a it was a pretty big statement, you know. And I do I, I like him. I think he's brash, you know. Even though he's busted the balls of, of teacher union and stuff like that, I understand why he was doing. It. I understand why he did what he did. It's not just politics to me. And yeah, he can be a dick sometimes, but who can't be a dick sometimes? And so I was just just curious because this guy who is who ran for Virginia's governorship was a real fuckbag. I mean, he was really an <laughs> asshole. I mean, to, to, to try to tell people what they can and can't do in certain situations or say, right. oh, you want to get a divorce? Why do you want to get a divorce? Uh, that, that's not a good enough choice. Stay married to this guy or this girl. You know, I mean, just to me, that some of those things are were pretty plain and pretty obvious. But then, of course, I'm always going to contradict myself by saying, Ron Paul's not a stupid person. Maybe he saw through that. Maybe that was all bullshit. Or maybe it wasn't as bad as the media played it out to be. But it was, I mean, I read it on RT. But I don't know. Maybe he was looking past all that and said, overall, the guy wants to have a smaller government you know, had the Federal Reserve not be so impactful. Maybe he had other ideas that were part of that pros and cons that Chris Christie talked about. Maybe that's how he was balancing things out. Yeah. Maybe the Libertarian wasn't thinking as... It wasn't as, as and in as, hindsight, sometimes we just look back and go, why the fuck did we back that? Yeah. Why did we do that? Kind of exactly. like when I was 16, <laughs> Uh-oh. I was really behind NWA. 
Oh, I like NWA. I loved NWA. Loved it. It was my it was very state first... of the art, man. Yeah, it was. I it mean, was. It was when, good did, music. when did when did rap like really come out? That was in the late eighties or mid well, or mid eighties. Uh, it was probably the, I would say it's the early eighties. Probably eighty one, eighty two is when the Sugar Hill Gang came out with their first songs and started becoming more popular. Really? Yeah. So when was when was NWA? Was that that's like 90, the, that's like eighty nine, eighty eight, eighty eight, eighty nine? Yeah. Yeah, that that's was my graduating my, class, eighty nine, man. Was it really? Mm-hmm. That was my first. The, Tonight's podcast, we wanted to talk about current events, what was going on in the world a little bit, but now we're actually going to get into the meat and potatoes of tonight's <laughs> podcast. It won't be quite as exciting probably as you think it's going to be, but that's okay. But you know what? It's, I, to what me, I do want, though, is I want, this would be a great, this is going to be a great podcast for those of you listening to email us and comment. comment we're going to do yeah. top tens. We're going to do top tens for music and for movies, and we'll have lots of discussions about it, but... This is a great chance for you to get on Facebook and post comments. A great chance for you to um, comment on the web page and give us your top ten movies, your top ten music. Because I know that during the discussion between Matt and I, I'm going to be like, "Oh fuck yeah, that song's on my top ten list," and I forgot it. Or, "Oh yeah, that movie is one that should be at the top of my list." So we want to hear from you guys as well. So please make sure you comment on there. Go ahead. You know, when you when, when you when you say it like that, the top ten. Hey, this is my top ten. This is my top five. Mm-hmm. It reminds me immediately of one of my top ten movies. It's on my which list. Which is High Fidelity. Yeah, John Cusack. I love that. I was watching Fantastic. clips of uh, of that movie and Jack Black. Well, that, that's when we really watch, first saw Jack, Jack Black. Black. Oh, my God, Jack Black. That's when you got introduced to his kind of comedy. I mean, that's the mainstream. I mean, that's the first time I really saw him as a comedic actor and how freaking phenomenal he was with that movie. Because it was yeah. so him. That was such... I mean... I think from what I was told was when they wrote the roles, he wrote it with Jack Black in mind to be that oh, guy. Oh, really? I, th- I think that's what they talked about. Because at a, at a very sad moment in the movie, the main character, John Cusack, is getting, he's on the phone talking to his ex-girlfriend about her dad dying. Right. And how, and is she going... Is she going to the funeral? When is she heading back into town? It's a very sad moment. And Jack Black is in the other room going, Man, what a night it really was. Mother, what a night it really was. Angina. I mean, he's just, and John Cusack comes out and he just starts slapping him. You know, it's a very, it's a, it's to, to be able to take something that's so heart wrenching yeah. as a death and something so hilarious as a comedian and to be able to sing about it and you just you throw these two things together. Yeah. And how can you not how can you not always remember that movie? It's one of those things. It's kind of like Breakfast Club, which is one of my all-time favorite movies iconic. also. They're iconic it's icon- movies. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're it's iconic. iconic. Well, and that's it- why my top 10 movies were more dramas, things that I liked so much that I watch all the time. And that's what I was that's what I I had for my movie list. I only did top tens. Yeah, I only did top tens. But um, the the fun thing about the the music one was trying to think of all the times that all these albums and these aren't songs; these are albums that I just deeply, deeply love because they're part of my growing up. I guess easy way to put it. I, it was hard to distinguish certain things. I could do an easily, because I grew up in the late 80s, I could easily do a top 10 of just hip-hop rap. Easy, easy, easy. From Public Enemy to the Beastie Boys to uh, Wu-Tang Clan and The Roots, you name it, I could definitely have just a list just for them. But I wanted to do like an iconic top 10 album list the ones that I listen to the entire album and still to this day listen to the entire album and just totally totally love and I guess I stuck more with the movies that um, kind of had impact on me drama wise comedies to me are, are easier because they're what we, we probably all think of as comedies and that we're all going to be pretty similar on that page, but I love. I would love to do. Um, I think maybe it'd be fun to do just a comedy one, just between the two of us, our top ten comedies, because I think we'd probably be both on exactly the same wavelength for that one. But so my movies are just going to be dramas. They're not going to be. Um, I didn't. I don't think. Yeah, I didn't mix up any 
any comedies in there at all. They're all dramas, and I have a, I have my top ten albums because, of course, we don't fucking listen to albums anymore, do we? We listen to single songs we buy for ninety nine cents on iTunes, which I love to iTunes by the way because they support our podcast. But uh, we don't listen to albums anymore, and so my top ten are top ten albums that I. To this day, listen, from the very first song to the very last song, they're so fucking good from beginning to end. You're fucking driving me crazy. Why? Because you you, you went into serious detail. You're picking albums. I can't remember. I mean, there's very few albums. There's a reason why people thought, oh, my God, I can buy just a song. When iTunes came out and you can buy just one song. For 99 cents. For 99 cents. I can just get that. I don't have to buy the whole shitty fucking album because you have one good song and 10 shitty ones. Maybe two or three good songs, but the rest are shit and you're paying 15, 18 bucks for an album. Well, I, I like, what I like the most about iTunes is the opportunity to listen to all the songs. I just like, you know, well, you, oh, you, sure, you get a little you, sample. Because you could pick them out. You could just yeah. kind of sample through. And at the same time, there are times when I buy whole albums just because I want to support the artist. So I'm like, fuck it. I'll just buy the whole thing. Just buy the whole thing. Yeah, I could buy two or three from them. But there are, I mean, uh, My Morning Jacket is a, a new band that I've really enjoyed quite a bit. Uh, somebody my t- Morning Jacket? My Morning Jacket, yeah. And they're very much like Crosby Stills Nash kind of sound, kind of like oh, okay. 70s kind of, you know, lighter music. Somebody told me that their most recent album was really good, so fuck it, just boom, bought it. And then somebody said, give me like five, the top five, their top five favorite songs, buy them. And so I went through and bought just those top five songs, and they're from their first two albums, I think. And there were those five are great songs, but the whole album that I bought, just like, I thought, fuck it, I'll just support them, and bought the whole album. I listened to the whole album. It's so, so good. It is like the most, you'd, you'd laugh, because it's like the most positive uplifting music you've ever heard. One's called A, a Wonderful Day, and it just like just fucking lifts my spirits just listen to it. It's like the best. I mean, it's just like <laughs> awesome. And you know, as you can tell, I, I fucking love everything, and everything's the fucking best. But which, yeah, which, I, uh, which, by the way, <laughs> there, there are a few uh, listeners who really like that about you. Who like what about me? That my movie is so good. <laughs> you mock me for it. People I do like mock you. It? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. There are some people that are that fucking crazy. Well, well thank you for the love. That's a, <laughs> but there's other people I, that are like, come on, dude. No, nobody thinks that. It's probably only, not. It's, only it's probably just it's me. It's only positive thoughts. It's just me. So do you want to do your, what do you want to do first? Movies you know or what? Uh, song? Why don't you do songs since we did kind of different Listen, music? You picked albums. When we talked about this, like our, uh, what are, what's your favorite? We wanted to do a podcast. What's your favorite music? What's your favorite movies? And the more I thought about it, the more confused I got. Not so much confused. That's probably the wrong term. The more complicated it got. Oh. Because you can have your favorite romantic songs, the kind of songs that you want to play when you're getting ready to do it with your lady. <laughs> A lot of Barry White songs. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have those songs. You have songs that you work out to. There are songs that you run to, and they're completely different favorite songs from what you run if you're running five, seven miles, or if you're powerlifting. Right. I mean, the, you ha- there's so many different categories of music that you love it for a different reason because it elicits a completely different emotion from you. Or the music I listen to when I, when I wash dishes. Correct. Probably not the same. (laughs) You do not. You do not listen to techno. (laughs) But some of the. uh, So I went with. I went on a different route. I went with music that really has stuck with me through the years because it it has such a strong emotional tie to me. Whatever was happening at that time in my life. That song coming out has just, it will never go away for me. Yeah. It'll just never go away. Stuff you me. listen to all the time, even now. Right. And so NWA was 100 Miles and Running. Oh, God, what a good fucking 100 song. 100 Miles and Running, 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 Running. <laughs> wow. I mean, that, that song in that album was extremely meaningful to me at my age when I was 16. It was my first glimpse, it was my first little interaction with adult stuff with adult uh, with, the swearing uh, just being like an that? adult well it was, i just gotten a job i had my own car i was 
I wasn't really paying my bills. I was, I was, <laughs> I had, my, I was making money to purchase things for myself. Right. You know, obviously, you're 16. And what, what really are you doing? It was the first time that I was really because I was working out of my hometown. I was in a different town. Uh, there was, I, I met older people. I met some seniors who uh, I was like, this is kind of cool. It's kind of like having a big brother. You know, this guy who's a couple years older than me, he's kind of like a big brother. I work with him, and he's introducing me to all these other people, you know, uh, inviting me to his school to work out on weights. It was it was just very, uh, it was just a, a milestone in my life. Cool. It was very big in growth, and here I'm listening to this music that there's no way in hell I would have ever listened to in my home, surrounded by my little nucleus right. <laughs> of my family, yeah. there's no way that I could have listened to that screaming through my speakers with my mom and dad right. hearing it. There's just <laughs> no way it would have happened. <laughs> but I could play it in my car. Yeah. You know? So that was kind of like my first breakthrough with, with music to where I was, just, I was listening to it going, oh my God, this is, this is like a little piece of my identity now. That's awesome. Being this well, little white boy. And I think that I think that I think I told you about this was um Quest Love, who is the drummer for the Roots, a really great hip hop band now that he's it's they're they're, they're he's they're the band for uh, uh Jimmy Fallon on his T V show at night. Okay. And he wrote a book called Mo Meta Blues. We should we should put a picture of that on the website. And link it to Amazon because it is just a, a really phenomenal book because it related. I related so much to it because his parents were musicians and he had he got used to get albums and things like that. He talks about buying Prince's. Um, oh, I don't know if it was Purple Rain or 1999. I can't remember which one it was, but it was really risque. And it might have, it might have even been no, it's one of those two. And his he bought the album like five or six times. Because his parents would always find the copy that he hid and then take it and take it away and destroy it. <laughs> He'd go buy another copy because he's an enormous Prince fan. And uh, it was just really cool to hear him talk about the, the, the way he lined up the, the, his autobiography, so to speak, of him and the roots was the albums that were coming out in the summers when he was hanging out with his parents. They traveled around, I think, doing um, gigs, musical gigs, stuff like that. And so he had his mom listen to his sister listened to all 70s music, right? The Eagles and Bread and all that kind of stuff. They had mom and dad who were listening to soul music and had somebody else who was hitting hip-hop and stuff. I mean, not hip-hop. Hip-hop was way, was way before hip-hop. But he talks about all the influences in his music. And there are songs that you know, that you, I know you've heard that are kind of hip-hop R&B-wise that he's drum for. And it, the song's just different because he is the one doing the percussions for it. It's just phenomenal. So the book is really good. But that's how I think of music, just like you do. I think of the time and the place of when I first heard that song or what was happening during that song. Like, uh, what's uh, Christopher Cross? Like a, you know... You talking about Criss Cross? No, Christopher Cross, the singer. <laughs> not Criss Cross. No, no. The not group Criss Cross? Not the, no, not the group. The backward but Christopher Cross... Um, had a book called Sailing, a book, had a song called Sailing Away. I think it was the early, late 70s, early 80s when this song came out. My parents were divor- had gotten divorced, and I was, I was becoming aware of having to fucking travel, fucking flying back and forth every summer, every year, flying back and forth, leaving, you know, yanking my heart out to leave one parent and go stay with another, and then yanking my heart out and leaving them and going to another one. And this song, Sailing by Christopher Cross, I remember being in the bathroom at my mom's house, just fucking sobbing because the next morning I was going to get on a fucking Greyhound bus and travel back to Iowa and having to be put in the middle of deciding, oh, I want to go live with my dad or, oh, I'm, gonna, I'm choosing my dad over you or I'm choosing you over my dad. You know what I mean? Having to, they didn't let us have those choices at a very, very young age that they now tell you is fucking horrible to do to a kid. But it, that Christopher Cross sailing song, to this day, I can smell the bathroom. I can see where I was standing. I remember looking in the mirror, watching myself cry, listening to that song in my brain, in my brain that song was playing, going, when is this ever going to end? This is just the most fucking horrible situation to be in. When is this going to stop? 
You know, I just hate feeling this way all the time whenever this happens. Did not mean to make the podcast take a fucking nosedive into hell. Jesus Christ. Hello. But that's how, but my point is that's how music can impact you. It right. sticks with you. And if it's So now when you hear that song, do you? Oh my God, yeah. I love the song. I just love the song. I think NSYNC remade it like when they were still together and I thought their version was really good. But to this day, yeah, I mean, it's still a melancholy song for me, mm-hmm. but it's not, it doesn't have, of course, the, quite the impact it did before. But it still will take me back to that place. And I can still, I'll hear certain songs from the late 70s, and I'll be like, oh, fuck. Yeah. I can remember that. You know, it always, I mean, of course, it was one of the sadder songs that kind of always struck me because of being in such sad situations. But it's just amazing to me that music can do that. That's why when they talk about taking away music programs from schools and stuff like that, I'm just like, fuck, don't you. Re- it's such a part of who we are as human beings, music is. No matter what you like, right. it really is an integral part of what makes us different from other creatures in the world, So I think. you know, Well, that might be true because they say music affects everything from plants to animals to you know, everything else. So. Yeah, but they also had a book where a photographer had taken pictures of frozen water molecules. And look, these are the molecules that, if someone's Emotions. in a good mood... <laughs> The ice cubes, the ice molecules Question look everything. like this. Wasn't the movie Question Everything that had that in there? Was it that or you don't know? Oh, you don't know Question Mark. It's some weird, don't yeah. Know. Yeah, it was. Anyways, go back to your thing. The next one that I have has, it's a, two, it's a twofer. It's a twofer. <laughs> it's one of my favorite movies. And it's, the, it's, one of the, it's one of my favorite songs from that movie. Because nice. a lot of times... I am a huge movie buff. I love movies. That's, it's one of my favorite things, and and it's not everybody's thing. You know, not everybody loves <laughs> loves going to movie theaters. It's our thing, though. It's, it is how our many times. Thing. How many times have we seen The Matrix together? Seven, at least, <laughs> at, least at least seven times in the theater. In the, in the we theater, we could not get enough of the technology. I, I can't. I don't. Even, I lost count. Of how many times we I can watched still remember it the, outside of the I still theater. remember the first time watching that movie in the theater, the two of us together, and us looking over each other at the same time with our mouths open, like, what the fuck is going on? What did we this just see? This is the most amazing we thing just I have ever seen. Yeah. It must have been like what adults who saw Star Wars the first time who were just like blown away by what they were able to portray on the screen. I just, we just couldn't wrap our heads around it. Anyways, what movie and song? It was The Matrix. No! Yeah. It was The Matrix. Oh, shit, the I movie, didn't realize that. Yeah, the movie was The Matrix. When you started talking about it, I was like, fuck, you're blowing my mind right now. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, the, the movie was The Matrix. And, again, the, the reason why I'm such a movie person, I think it all comes down to growing up. It was kind of a ritual with me and my mom. It was like every Sunday, my mom and I would go to church. We'd come in, we'd drive into town. We'd take the trip, 30-minute trip into town. Uh, Sunday was the day to go to church, get groceries, do whatever shopping you were going to do, and see a movie. If you're going to see a movie, you're going to see a movie on Sunday. And that that time away from my home with my mom, just her and I, having uh, and, and and we, her and I, we love the same types of movies, sci-fi and silly types of movies. So. To be able to share that experience, and it was such a positive, loving, wonderful experience. It's kind of like we would go to the movies, and it's like, hey, mom, can I get candy? Yes. It's like, it's like a holiday. For me, going to the movie theater was like a holiday. It's like Christmas or Thanksgiving. The cookies are out. Christmas and Thanksgiving. You can have whatever you want. Right. Get sick, kids. Run around. Be stupid. I mean, that was kind of the, the, the feeling I had when I went to a movie theater with my mom growing up. So having that type of feeling that's what i i can go to a movie theater by myself oh yeah i can go to a movie theater the only reason that i even halfway consider not going to a to a movie by myself is if the if the movie is somewhat geared towards younger uh teenagers like i mean (laughs) so not like cars or i mean it could be a a, story i mean no i mean well i will those are good those are good movies me as a parent now i can appreciate those movies and sometimes like my kids are at school or my wife's at work and i have the day off i'm like fuck it i want to go to a movie what's out there right now nothing really except for this one movie that i do want to see it's kind of a kid's movie (laughs) 
<laughs> Fuck it, I'll go. But then I started thinking, uh, do I kind of look like a pedophile? <laughs> this is a little fucked up. What's funny? I can't though, go to this movie. I don't have my kids with me. We used to go to, when you and I used to go to movies together. We used to see other guys who were there together, and they'd always have that chair in between <laughs> them. And you and I were like, "Fuck it, we want to talk. We want to chat." The, end, the total uh, homophobes <laughs> wouldn't even. The two best friends wouldn't even sit by each other. And we were like, "What the fuck?" Yeah, screw it. Yeah. We're sitting by each other. So what the hell? The Matrix. Okay. What's the song? The song is by Remstein. Du, uh, du hast, du hast Nietzsche, du yeah. hast Nietzsche. And I mean, when he, when that song comes on, be, when I watched The Matrix, I loved that idea of you could do anything. The, it, it's completely wide open. You can do anything. It was just so energy pumping. You think that air? That, you think that's air you're breathing right now? That's not air you're breathing. God, that was such a good part yeah. of that movie. Go ahead. Uh, so I loved everything about that movie. I just totally was so into it. And that was one of those, that song comes on while Neo is walking through this dance club. And it's it's so dark and it's it's uh, there's people wearing leather and it's just so aggressive and sexual and to and to hear that song it just it gets your adrenaline pumping so that was one of those songs that i still listen to it's still on my phone now when i work out i just i love that it 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 sets the tone for me it sets the tone for me that's that's the best i can do (laughs) but the matrix or having that song, there, there's a lot of other songs from the, from the Matrix. It's songs that I wouldn't normally have thought I enjoyed, but because they are so strongly associated with those scenes from the Matrix, whether it was a fight scene or whatever, like Marilyn Manson. It's not a, it's, Marilyn Manson is not generally an artist that I would I would be like, hey man, I just want to jam to Marilyn Manson all day. Other, some people might like that. That's fine. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying, for me personally, Marilyn Manson is not one of those performers that I get a lot from, except for I tied it with that movie to that movie because it's in that soundtrack. So I well, and that'd be the same case for Breakfast Club has some great music in it. Sure, you know, I mean, it's those some of those movies. That's that's part of it is that the, the music really ties into the the show in itself and the characters, and you engage in so many different things yeah so remstein the matrix that's kind of a twofer i love soundtracks soundtracks for me because i am such a movie buff seeing the power that a soundtrack has on other people is really funny too to me because when i whenever the movie rocky was on when i was a kid jim would get down and start pumping out push-ups isn't that hilarious? <laughs> it's so funny to think of. <laughs> it's so funny to think of my dad doing that, jumping down, and just being like, dun 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 dun, or Eye of the Tiger comes on. I mean, he just couldn't help himself. He could not help himself to get down and start doing, knocking out some push-ups. I'm like, come on, do some push-ups with me. Very nutty, very nutty. But it. Those soundtracks, those songs are iconic to me. It's not like I want to listen to Eye of the Tiger every day. <laughs> but it's Nor it's you. it's yeah. But it's music that is that is always gonna be with you. It has a special place in your heart because it you can identify it so strongly with a point in your life and your history that you don't want to let go of. Right. Because I don't want to let go of the fact that my dad was a dumbass <laughs> right. at some point doing push-ups and being silly and it was just, it was a well i had the same moment. thing with like the flash dance movie and the soundtrack from flash dance yeah. my dad and my mom at the time they would splash water in themselves no. <laughs> yeah we had a thing set up <laughs> in the bathroom your dad uh, would sit on a chair and <laughs> but it was it was all the dancing and stuff my my stepmom at the time was um, like warmers really in the really in the dancing yes you were like warmers really and they're coming back too by the way Really into dancing, a lot of like jazz dancing, tap dancing, not just that kind of stuff. But so that movie was appealing in the sense it was very music and dancing based. But my uh, the workout, you know, like her, her, you know, her working out by running in place, you know, rubbing her thighs and that whole scene that Tommy, <laughs> that Tommy Boy recreated as well. Um, right. 
That was one of those things I remember from the soundtrack. But I'm with you. Forrest Gump soundtrack, one of the greatest soundtracks of all time. Sure. Soundtrack from uh, Wedding Singer. Good Morning Vietnam. Good Morning Vietnam. Incredible. Wedding Singer with uh, one, of my, one of my only good movies that I think Adam Sandler did. Great soundtrack from the 80s for The Wedding Singer. So, I mean, some of those soundtrack, if they really put their mind to it, are fantastic. Zach, uh, what was his name, who did... Um, Footloose. Dude, oh, the yeah. soundtrack to Footloose. the original Footloose. movies, Footloose. Yeah. Again, my mom and I, Sunday, going to get groceries, we had a 280ZX. Sweet. Yeah, we had a sweet car, man. Yeah, my, mom was, my mom was pretty awesome. <laughs> but this was the thing that, at, at first it didn't bother me, but then I'm getting to be like a, almost a teenager, so then it's like holding hands with mom isn't cool anymore. But, you know, you have songs from Footloose, come on, from Kenny Loggins, and you just can't, you can't not move. You're moving, man. And she would grab my hand, because we had like a stick shift, you know, between us, and she'd have her hand on a stick shift, and she'd just grab my hand, she'd be be (laughs) pumping our hands to the beat of the song, you know, and going back and forth, swinging, and and now I'll, I'll do that with my kids at times, and just the other day... My mom and I were in the same car together, and a song came on, and I grabbed her hand, and I started swinging her hand around together to the beat of the song. And it was, again, one of That's those really... That's a wonderful really, story. Yeah, That's this is a really, really sweet, loving type of moment that you share. You share, share. Yeah. I was going to say the Garden State soundtrack to me is up there as one of the best soundtracks. Really? It introduced me to the Shins, introduced me to a lot of people that I hadn't really heard of. Colin Hay from Men at Work. I'm going to have to make he a note was, of that. He, he did a, a, a ma- he's got an amazing solo career, but I hadn't heard very much of him, and one of the first songs I heard was in that movie, because I always thought, I always loved his voice in particular from Men at Work, and so now he just does, he's like almost like a singer-songwriter with a guitar and just sings, not with a big band, but just got, the songs especially on the Garden State soundtrack that he did are just beautiful, beautiful songs. Really good. You need to burn through your list before our podcast is fucking over. Okay, Jesus, there. okay. Now, Don't burn through it, but Now, uh, another one that I love because I, at one point in time I loved doing powerlifting, uh, it was, and I shared that with a, a really great friend of mine, and that, the, the, sound, the, the album actually was Eminem, or I'm sorry, the artist was Eminem, and I used to hate Eminem. I used to hate it. I used to just throw it in there with, oh my God, that's just, here's just another terrible rapper, and I'm not going to listen to it. I'm not going to listen to the lyrics. I'm just turn the radio off or change the channel. But then I started at this time. It was like 2001 era. At this time, I start. I actually started listening to the lyrics, and it was during the Eight Mile when the Eight Mile movie kind of came out, and I started listening to the lyrics. I'm like, holy shit, is this real? Did he, I mean, it was the first time that I was actually hearing rap and going, okay, here's a story behind this. And a lot of people who give rap a hard time for the misogyny of it or the violence don't realize that they are rapping about things that truly did take place. Now you can have a discussion whether that should be in a song that influences kids or not is a whole other thing. But they're not just making shit up. Very often they're talking about their lives. And I thought 8 Mile did a really good job of that. Yeah. Okay, last song, and then we can move into movies. Or you is this top 10? Do you do 10? I didn't, no, I didn't do 10. Oh, you just did a general idea. I, yeah. I was, I'm, very I'm an, not, I was very anal about mine. You were, I was very analytical. You're great about I really music. Just I, can't, make, I can't sit and be like, hey, remember that song? And name like the artist. And It's kind of like people with sports. They can tell you... <laughs> Who the football the the quarterback was and where he went to college and Josh where his stats were. Base for, uh, I can't do that with music. Yeah. I can't do that. I, I got to tie it emotionally, or else I don't. I don't. Know, I don't you. remember anything. Mm-hmm. But the very last one you're gonna Britney Spears. Oops, I did it again. Really? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It's fucking nutty. Oops, I did it again. Britney Spears. Actually, I should just say Britney Spears from that time period when she was a teenager and, and she was doing the song where she plays a schoolgirl in the hallway of, uh, of the high school. And my, it I, my wife used to wear one right of those skirts, man. God damn it. <laughs> Go ahead. It just sucked me in. And every time I heard the lyrics, I could picture... A sexy young girl, and it would get my it would get me going, man. It would make me want to work out harder. It would make me want to run faster. Really? Even it was just so silly because it's just such a teeny bopper well, song. It is, but it's got a good beat. I mean, there's a parts of that song that are. I understand why you would do that. I mean, yes, she was she was cute in the video, but that song's got a, a pump. Yeah, she's cute in the high school video. She's hot as fuck in the. Oops, I did it again. Skin tight red. Oh, 
oh, outfit. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That. So anyway, that's my music. That's the, and of course, there's tons of music that I enjoy that I listen to now. But th- these are like the ones that really. These are the stair steps of Matt. I really, I really, I really, really like your list. I, I almost wish I had been a little more, uh, a little more open to seeing what popped in my head because, as much as I love music, and you know that, do you, you know, of all your friends, I probably talk and make you listen to more music than you probably Yeah, you to. actually bring more music into my life than anybody else. <laughs> so I did, a, I did a quick list of, of albums that are, are the most impactful for me, personally. Okay. Number one is Sgt. Pepper's by the Beatles. Hands down to me, one of the great, the greatest album of all time, period. I've never listened to it. Okay, so I, my dad introduced me to Sgt. Pepper when I was in third grade. And I remember sitting... Oh my God, you're so much like your father. I remember sitting in front of a record player with headphones on, like you would make like in high fidelity literally I yeah. didn't even think about it until just a second and reading the back of the album had all the lyrics on it listening to every single song in order and following along with the words as they read it and I remember like being in tears in some songs I mean just like because there I mean there's one um, fuck see that you think I'm good at names but there's a couple songs on there that have to do like oh within you without you is a song on Sgt. Pepper's that is just phenomenal song. It's just so different than anything I'd ever heard before. And a lot of people attribute that to them really being into marijuana and LSD at the time. Because Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and things like that that are really kind of out there or on there. But Within You, Without You, to me, is one of my favorite songs of all time, period, along with the album. But um, Sgt. Pepper's is my whole entire childhood was the Beatles. And then... In the 80s, when I first got introduced to Public Enemy, It Takes a Nation and a Million to Hold Us Back was their second album. I never, ever heard anything like that in my life. And you talk about rap music having lyrics that make sense, you know? Public Enemy was all about social issues. It was not about bitches and hoes and all the kind of things that we generally talk about when it comes to rap music. It Takes a Nation and a Million to Hold Us Back is, hands down, for me, if I had to do a top 10 hip-hop rap List. Yeah, I mean, what about Tupac? They'd be, oh, see, I'm a big Tupac fan too. But I'm talking about just albums in particular because this this album I listen to from beginning to end. Sgt. Pepper's I listen from beginning to end. I listen to all the songs on it, and that's why they kind of have an impact because mm-hmm. it's a whole chunk of music. It's not just one song at one point, like the Christopher Cross song, "Check Your Head" by the Beastie Boys. That was more like in the early '90s. I just thought the Beastie Boys were the funnest, coolest guys out yeah. there at the time. Yeah. Um, so check your head by the BC boys. Incredible album. Thriller. Gotta have Thriller on there. Michael Jackson's okay. Thriller. Okay. I do. Great. I loved Thriller. Absolutely. Especially I do. You're a huge the... Michael Jackson fan so I, <laughs> I knew you'd like that one. Uh, there's, an, there's one called uh, an album called The Low End Theory by A Tribe Called Quest. Another rap okay, album. Sure. Again, very, very different hip hop rap than was kind of mainstream. And I have NWA on here as well. I love NWA. Um, no, actually I don't but I do like NWA. So the low end. You don't theory, have them on your list. I don't have them on my list, but I NWA. do like NWA. Oh, I mean, I like Ice Cube. I love Ice T. I like all those right. guys. The, so the low end theory to me was incredible. Me, myself, and I by uh, De La Soul. Again, that was when I was okay. in high school. Again, sure. very different kind of hip hop, but super unique. Let's see. I have the Chronic by Dr. Dre. That was one of the. It's that's kind of up there with NWA with me. It was the first kind of West Coast rap that I was listening to because Dr. Dre was with NWA for a while. I believe they're kind of one of the same. Okay, I'm not very I'm sure. Not sure. I'm with my hip hop lineage. I have absolutely no idea what how those. I think they're kind of similar. I think Dre either did production for NWA or, or something. But anyway, so I have the Chronic on there. I have Hello Nasty by the Beastie Boys. Again, another. Just mind they, blowing album. I mean, the, the, the Beastie Boys had a com- so such a completely different, like synthesized rap. And also, they also play instruments. They're bass players. They're guitar players. I mean, they actually play instruments as well. And there's there's songs on Hello Nasty. And the very last song on the album is just music. Like it's people them playing music. There's no rapping involved. There's no scratching or anything like that. It's just them playing a song on instruments. It's it's they're incredible. And Junior, who will be out of boot camp in two weeks, by the way, he still remembers as a kid of us listening to that album over and over and over again because it was just so unique. He'd be like, oh, hey, Dad, is this the song that has that weird thing in it? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's, this is that song. And so he'd be waiting to hear that one part because he liked it so much. So I got Hello Nasty, incredible. Yellow by Coldplay, their very first popular album that came out. Right. I think okay. Yellow, again, from top to bottom is is fantastic. Yellow Brick Road by Elton John. Again, kind of with the B 
Beatles in the sense that my dad introduced me to Elton John, and that was kind of when I started becoming aware of music in the late 70s. It was kind of when Elton John was getting really, really popular. And then 1999 by Prince and Purple Rain by Prince. That's a twofer, because those two, <laughs> those two albums are just too fucking incredible. Just... I don't know. I it's hard. Maybe Purple Rain because of the movie. I associate the movie a lot with. It. That was mm-hmm. the first time I saw like you talking about adult things. Mm-hmm. You know, the sex scenes in that movie were so controversial at the time. You know, and I remember my dad talking me or I, me talking my dad into taking me, and then how un- fucking horribly uncomfortable I felt watching the sex <laughs> scene with my father. So I, Purple Rain to me and is is incredible. 1999 is a great a great album too. But, but I would probably have to take 1999 off of there and just just do Purple Rain because of the movie because that's that album is just punch a high off you know just fucking just talk about drive and pump right. you up mm-hmm. jesus that's such a, a great album so that's my that's that's my top 10 albums but the same thing you said though is that they all have poignant time like, oh I can, yeah you I could can, you could make top five or top 10 lists on on any type anything. of topic for music because music is so profoundly different and it i mean just proof is in the pudding i love Oops, I did it again yeah. by Britney Spears. And, I mean, Christina Aguilera had... I mean, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of artists like Christina Aguilera, like uh, Marilyn Manson. They're so diverse. They're so different. And I even but goes, I, there are songs of, of each that I just told. I really, really like. But those were the songs. That, the songs that I listed were really, like, like I said, milestones or stepping stones in the history of Matt. Yeah, and I think that... When it comes to, I, I like soundtracks so much like you do that in the beginning, you know, you'd have a soundtrack that had like three or four good songs in it that were popular. And then you had like instrumental sections, right? That were kind of like, oh, I remember that part, that scene that was the background music mm-hmm. to that scene. Sure. Now there are whole entire soundtracks I listen to that. that are just the background music. Thomas Newman is a, a, a soundtrack. I don't know what they, do they call them soundtracks? I don't know what they do. Anyways, he's a composer. Yeah, they're still called soundtracks. He's a, he's a composer that he does soundtracks for movies, right? So American Beauty did a soundtrack for that one. He did Jarhead, the soundtrack for that one. He did Wall-E, Disney movie. He did all these soundtracks, and they are wonderful. They are like the most beautiful things to listen to as background noise. So when I, if I want to listen to music, you know, like uh, Pandora, Sure. I do light 70s. I just fucking love light 70s music. In, but if I'm going to do something that, does, that requires me to be thinking and I want just background music, I'll put on my Thomas Newman station on Pandora. It'll play all the music that he's done for soundtracks. Uh, the Help. You name it, he's done a soundtrack for some of these, these things. And he's so, it's so distinguishable now that I'll hear it on TV shows or I'll hear it in movies and I'll be like, oh, that's Thomas Newman. And my wife will be like, how do you know that? I was like, I can do the way he composes music and puts it together, it's they're all. I mean, they're not all the same, but you can kind of get the idea of There's what a he distinctive likes. Distinctive feel. What was it. the HBO? There was an HBO movie about guys who ran a funeral parlor, parlor back in the day. Six Feet Under. He did the soundtrack <clears throat> for that one. I mean, he's got a really distinct sound. The way he does Aaron Brockovich, the movie Aaron Brockovich. I can just keep listening on and on because, and they're all. I mean, they're all very different sounding. But think about the scene from American Beauty where he's laying in bed, fantasizing with the girl above him with the rose petals following down, and and mm-hmm. she's like, remember that scene? Sure. There's a tinkling kind of music playing in the background. Right. That makes the scene of that movie. The 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 soundtrack makes you gives you kind of like a dream like kind of state and really puts you in a mindset of this guy is really fantasizing, fantasizing is really out there. And I think it's the music that really sets some of those tones. Can I, can I add one more? Yeah. Since I didn't have 10. And I, I'm really surprised. <laughs> You're allowed two more. That's okay. it. Just two. But I, I'm really surprised I didn't say, I didn't put, the, I didn't write this down, but Sarah McLachlan, Fumbling Towards Ecstasy. Ooh. Fumbling Towards Ecstasy there you was go. the album. And I was introduced to that when I went overseas, when I was in the military. And it, now this, all of you who are not old enough to understand this shit, <laughs> we did not always have MP3 players, you young b- fuckers. Remember that when we, they first came out? You're like, you put all this music on this little thing? Oh, yeah. my God. Dude, I was freaked. Out. No, I'm, I'm trying to set a tone here because when I went overseas, <laughs> my buddy had a CD player. Ooh. With little tiny little speakers that I had never seen anything like this before. I had never seen portable anything. Portable music? I had never seen portable music like this before. I had seen boom boxes and I had seen um, cassette tape players. 
headphones, but I had never seen somebody with a collection of CDs uh, that I could listen to. So that was one of my roommates, one of my best friends when I was overseas, uh, rooming with him, he had Sarah McLaughlin's Fumbling Towards Ecstasy. Oh, okay. And I was such a whiny little, not whiny, but I was so homesick. I was newly married. Uh, I, was, I was just missing my sweet, beautiful little wife back in Iowa so badly that I listened to this fucking album every <laughs> day, over and over and over, every night. And there's times when you, I was over in the Sinai Desert where one of our outposts is up on this mountain top. I mean, the tippy, tippy top. And at night, it's like, it's, it's, it's unlike anything you've ever seen. If you've, if you've always lived in a city, if you've always lived in the United States, if you've never been to a very barren part of the world to be able to look up and see the, the stars... When you're out in the desert and there's no cities around you, nothing, there is no, there are no other lights. What's that called? Light? Light. Like when street lights fracture into the atmosphere and it Yeah, but it's called, it's called a certain something. It's not sure. like light contamination or light huh. something. Anyways. Fuck it. Maybe I'll put it in later. <laughs> <clears throat> Make me sound smart. But to see that stuff and listening to Sarah McLaughlin as I'm having this really amazing experience where I'm seeing these stars, I mean, I can see the Gulf of Aqaba is below me and across the Gulf is Iraq, or I'm sorry, Saudi Arabia. And, it, and, and just to my left is Israel, and I can see the lights. I mean, you take a 19-year-old kid and you throw him across the world, and all of a sudden you, he's seeing, I'm seeing things that I've, I just could never have imagined before. It's like, holy shit, I'm actually looking across the Gulf of Aqaba, and there's a whole other country right there. It's a completely different country right there. And just over there, that's, there's Israel. Oh, right. my God. And so now, I fall, if I'm having a hard time falling asleep now, today, currently, I just listened to it last night, I will put my headphones on, and, and I have it on my phone, and I'll listen to Sarah McLachlan fumbling <laughs> towards ecstasy, the whole album. I'll listen to the whole thing, and it'll put me right out. And I will smell, I can smell the desert. I can smell the desert. It's, it takes me right back to that moment of time when I'm sitting on the mountaintop, and I'm saying to myself, this is never going to end. This is never, I was really depressed. It's never going to end. I'm always going to be on this fucking mountaintop. You can transport yourself back to that yeah. moment in history because of a song. It's just, it, the power of music is just well, amazing. And I, think, and I think it's also the situation. You know, I mean, I would say that all those things were impacting all your senses and your thinking at the time. And along with the music really can make a huge impact. Mm. I hate to, I feel like I'm almost demeaning your wonderful uh, picture you painted there. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> um, I was going to say, to me, one of, the, one of those really great soundtracks is Almost Famous Soundtrack, the Cameron Crowe movie, and his wife. Well, I mean, that takes you back to one of your favorite time periods. It's yeah. like the late 70s. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But, it, it's, it's, but it's also that movie, and I think his wife, I want to say Nancy Wilson. No, I don't know if that's right. Anyways, she used to be, she's part of the people, she's the other, she and her sister were the band Heart back in the day. Oh, okay. So she did the soundtrack for his movie, like the, the musical soundtrack and stuff, but she got all those songs for it. But you're right, again, Almost Famous soundtrack is just, it's way up there as being fucking incredible. But it's awesome. Do you want to do uh, movies? Movies. Do movies. Are, we, are you good with music? I think we hit some yeah, no, pretty I'm, I'm, good I'm, high points yeah, with mu- I'm, movies I'm, I'm or music. With, I'm good with music. Like I, like I said before, there's tons of music out there, great artists, wonderful music, and there's a lot of other songs that I listen to. Those are just And I guarantee you people are going to make comments about it. I'll be like, oh, God, yeah. yeah. That's a great one. Absolutely. I love that song. <laughs> yeah. I would have to say, I'm going to go with the first one, because when I was, again, I'm trying to correlate. Are you doing all movies or are there comedies mixed in here? It's just everything. This is everything. Fuck. This all is right. just everything. It's I just did dramas, so I'll have, to, I'll have to go back and do okay. comedies. Well, I, got, I, think I'll, I think hopefully I'll have a lot that will touch on yours. 
The first movie I ever had a crush on a woman with. This is the first one I've ever had a crush on a movie with. Another deep one. I just got a fucking list. You got a a lifetime. Go ahead. Mannequin. (laughs) Mannequin. (laughs) Holy shit. Changed my life. Again, went to the movie. Is Universal Soldier on this list, by the way? No. Universal Soldier is not on this list. (laughs) Mannequin. I I love the whole idea. Who is in that? It's the it's the it's the lady from Sex in the City, the one. Oh, oh, the one who likes having sex all the time. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh god, it's on the tip of my tongue. I, I know what you mean. Go ahead. All right. Um, but anyway, I loved that movie. I love uh, to me. I love fantasy. I love movies that I don't like the norm. I don't like the norm. I don't like boring. Every day, I like to have a magical sense to things. Yeah, a fantastical sense to things. Well, that's why I like superhero movies and stuff like that. Yeah, I, you know, yeah, I think I like superhero movies for a, a slightly. I, I, I don't know if I want to necessarily go into that, but I, I think I, la- I have a fascination with superhero movies for a complete for a for a kind of a deeper reason. But anyway, Mannequin was it Kim? Kim Cattrall? Yeah. Kim Cattrall. God, you did have a crush on her. Yes, it is Kim Cattrall. You're a I couldn't. I According watched to IMDb. It's Kim I Cattrall. watched that movie so many times. Loved the, just the idea of it. Because here, here's this guy who, who is doing something that he loves doing. And likewise, that movie reminded me a lot of yeah, she Just had a whole musical believe career. We are magic. Yeah, she was in Xanadu. She Xanadu. Xanadu. God damn it, that yeah. was it exactly. The movie Xanadu, I remember that as a little little kid being in love with the idea that, you know, this wonderful magical creature could just happen upon a normal moral guy. Right. Be, uh, mannequin again, it's just like Xanadu to me. It was like very similar themes, but I just I loved that idea of Mannequin. That's awesome. But yeah, that was that was one of my movies that I just I loved Mannequin and the 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 gay the guy who plays the gay guy who always had different sunglasses. He always had crazy glasses on. You talking about Mannequin? On Mannequin? Oh, see, I don't think I've ever seen that movie. What? Oh my god, he's so funny. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous. It's funny. Ridiculous is good because if Rock was here, you know what his favorite movie is what MacGruber. <laughs> I've been, to, right. his, I've been right. to his house three times. And I've I'm going to have to give it a shot. I'm going to have to give it a it's shot. It's really horrible, but I understand why he likes it. I can see why it's funny. Okay. Well, um, well, me, what is one of your favorite movies? Okay. Uh, again, I get pretty. By far, my hands down favorite movie of all time is Goodwill Hunting. That's, that's, okay, yeah, and I can see that's why. That's my number one. That's awesome. It always is my number one. Well, I mean, every single time they're in that scene, no, it's not your fault, son. Yeah, I know. It's heartbreaking. I start fucking crying. I know, but there's... And I'm a manly fucking man. And, there's, and I start <laughs> crying every time. There's no... There's, and there's so many funny parts that are also dramatic, like when he goes, what do you want to do with your life? And he goes, I want to get some sheep and tend to them. And he's like, <laughs> get out. You shucking me? Yeah. If you want to jerk off, go home and get a warm, a warm towel. I'm not, I don't need to deal with your bullshit. You know? And wow, it, very really nice. really funny, right? Which I yeah. think is hilarious. I mean, you have Robin Williams doing a one-liner that he's so good at, but he's playing a role, and it just mm-hmm. really fit well together. And plus, fucking Matt Damon is the bomb in that movie. So that was mine. I think Good Will Hunting is up there for me, which is, all like you said, it's funnier and shit at times. Hey, like them apples. That's when yeah. people got that from. I love that. And then, you know, then other times, it's, it's super impactful. You know, yeah. you ever dealt with that before? Yeah. My dad was a drunk, and the, the colorful nights when he wore his rings. And, I mean, just shit. Yeah. This little one-liners were what, just what fucking would be a, What would strikes. be a good morning for you? What would be a good morning for me? Showing up at your front door, knocking on it, and knowing that you're gone. Right. And that you didn't even say goodbye. That would be And great. I knew you were gone. Yeah, you were, you were moving on with your life and not stuck yeah. here. Yeah. That's just too good. For, for the best friend to say that. Okay. Here's another one. Risky business. Oh, another good one. That movie was on the other day. And I immediately felt like a little kid, and that I should turn the channel because my mom was going to come in, and I shouldn't be—I shouldn't get caught watching it. Another awkward because, sex movie with my father. Yeah, <laughs> watching them fuck on the watching them fuck on the train, which all those sex scenes were so great. Oh, oh god! Oh god! I just blew out everyone's eardrums because I'm coughing into this fucking mic. Oh. 
<laughs> well, there's Dude, so many good. You cannot watch a sex scene with your dad. I didn't know there were going to be sex scenes in it. Oh god. So, so there, there, and, and those are really good sex scenes in that movie. Yeah, it's hot. It's and really yet, hot. I still part of me and the, my memory of that movie when I first saw it is really awesome. Like my first sex scenes in a movie, right. and then when my father's sitting next to me, <laughs> so it's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible and great at the same time. Why do you like the movie so much? Risky business. Yeah, uh, I think it was because it was like the the whole puberty thing. Oh you sure. Know, like, uh, I, and I, every high schooler's fucking dream. Sure. Right? And it, just, I mean, it was so funny because his parents are gone, and of course the scene that I. I see when I'm flipping through the channels, the scene that comes across is him sitting in his tidy whities in his bedroom and he's on the telephone talking to a prostitute trying to set something up and he brings his catcher's, <laughs> he brings his catcher's mask down over his face oh, as God. he's talking on the phone like, Classic. like he's trying to protect himself from the phone. Oh, shit, it was funny. Good, good stuff. Yeah. Woo. Woo. Good Very Lord. Nice. Another one of mine then? Yeah, uh, yeah. I know this is this is a big this is a, this one will really lift up the crowd. Uh, the Deer Hunter, never saw it with Robert De Niro, never saw and it. Christopher Walken. No, nope. these are. I mean, you saw Full Metal Jacket is probably more of your you know what you are familiar with when it comes to like brutal war movies. But the Deer Hunter with Robert De Niro and what's a uh, who's the she's a super famous actress has a couple two well, or three that narrows Oscars. it down. That narrows it down even more. Um, she, but she's an older actress now. But she's whenever she's up, she wins it. She was like the she was in. Uh, I don't, dude. I don't even watch that stuff. I have no, I have fuck. no clue. Anyway, she's young in this movie, and she's just phenomenal. But Robert, I mean, these three guys who are all from this small. I think it's like a small steel town, and they all sign up to Vietnam together. And then it's like, boom, they're in it, and it's just the fucking crazy. It was the first war movie I saw when I was, and my dad let me watch that when I was like 12 or 13, I think. And it it just, it brought home Vietnam even more than like Platoon did. It was fucking brutal. It was like so hard to watch. It was just so brutal. And you just felt like you were in it with them. And Christopher Walken is just, I mean, you'll be surprised when you watch it because they're all look like they're babies. Robert De Niro, he, he he always looks a little bit older. But Christopher Watkins, this tall, fucking that big around, skinny dude, but he's still him, you know. But just incredible acting, incredible acting, and just an amazing story. You know, sad and depressing and dark and all that wonderful, sure. like you know, yeah. wonderful Vietnam movie. But again, on I'm my ta- top, I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes. I'm actually, I'm actually gonna the try Deer to Hunter watch is that incredible. movie. And- You'll love it. Go ahead. Uh, here, here's one that, uh, really shaped a large portion, many, many moons, many months went by. Have you masturbated to this movie? No. Oh. In sheer fucking terror (laughs) to the point where I told my mom, mom, I need help because I'm seeing Freddy. Uh, nightmare, a nightmare on Elm Street. Really? Fucking wrecked me. <laughs> it wrecked me. And I couldn't stop watching it. It was such a weird paradigm. I could not sleep at night. I had terrible fucking nightmares. And I had parents who said, get the fuck out of our room. You're not sleeping with us. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, I, I was a part of that generation where I did not sleep in my parents' bedroom, whereas now, all three of my kids make Well, that's the your rounds. fucking fault. That's not because know, of some generational no, no. I, thing. I know. I know it's my fault. I know this. <laughs> I know this. But I'm just saying, I, didn't, I wasn't comforted. Right. That nobody way. was telling wasn't you. That, nobody coddled me. So, but I could not get enough of that fucking movie. Oh, so you kept watching it. So it was like you watched it one time it. and it... No, no, no. I watched it. It was awesome. It scared the fuck out of me. I kept having nightmares. I'd watch it again. I could not stop watching it. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. Oh, God, that you kept watching it. Now I can see a kid going, oh, I watched the movie. It really scared me really I was bad. Addicted, but- I was addicted to all the Freddy movies. I was oh. addicted to all of them. But I, it was it really <laughs> just, that was the first time I had ever watched something and been so traumatized. I mean, I was really traumatized by it to where really? I was... It, the idea of Nightmare on Elm Street, you don't know when you're asleep. You don't know when you're awake. Oh, sure. You know? So even walking home from the fucking bus stop, I had to walk through people's yards. We lived in this huge neighborhood that was kind of on this big hill. Like, 
so the I would it would easily take me seven eight minutes to walk home from the bus stop, and I'm walking through people's yards, backyards. There's trees and everything, and it would scare the fuck out of me at four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, four o'clock in the afternoon, I'd be like, all of a sudden that shit would get in my head and I would be sprinting home. Oh. <laughs> sprinting home. That's awesome. Yeah. The only thing, that only time besides recently with um, closing, uh, the, fourth, the fourth kind, is that what The fourth kind, The fourth kind, the fourth yeah, kind the fourth that, kind. that but, uh, shit my pants in the middle of the day was, um, <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> was uh, and that nice. was really fucking horrible. That was really a horrible, to this day I can't watch it. It just scares me too fucking bad. It's, and it's, it's sad and pathetic, I realize, but it just scares me too bad. Because I just believe too much. I just believe, I believe in UFOs. I believe uh, creatures, creatures from other planets. And so when I see that movie, there's a, the little bit that's believable for me Mm-hmm. It's just too much. Anyways, when I was living alone, I lived in uh, uh, Northern California in a town called Nevada City. And I lived in a, a small apartment above a friend's house. And uh, I had a friend who worked at a, you know, a video store at the time, so she'd hook me up with some free movies. Well, my brother, in all of his wonderful wisdom, said, hey, this is a fantastic book. You've got to see the movie. And I was like, oh, okay, awesome. That sounds great. And so I had Christopher Walken in, so I knew he'd be a good actor. So this is... Communion, right? This is called communion. And it's a true, supposedly a true story about a man who goes to a cabin with some friends in the woods and is abducted, abducted by aliens. And the only bad part about it is it's everybody's worst fucking nightmare when you kind of see like that half a face or that you half... You wake up middle of the night, you look out your bedroom door. And you, you see like half door. a... Even if, even if, it was your, if it was one of your children, if you wake up and you look out the door and you see half of your child's face peeking out from behind the door, Just it's, a little, it's a little spooky. Yeah, it's a little and spooky. And so this is an alien head peeking around the door. Chucky. And I mean, I st- all of a sudden, I, st- I mean, if I had had less sense, I would have screamed really loud out loud. I mean, that's how bad it scared me when I watched it. And again, I was by myself in this apartment in the woods above an apartment above a friend's business. And I'm watching communion of a guy who's in the woods in the cabin and gets abducted. And so, I mean, I walked around and shut all the fucking doors in this well, yeah, place. That's a must. That's a Cause must. I could, I that's was like, I can't one. take a chance of seeing half a face. No matter who it is, I'm, yeah. just, I'm just shutting doors. And if you see that movie, it's scary because I showed. I think I showed you the clip of him being hypnotized, sure. and he's yeah. reliving it. But yeah. in his tr- in his state of hypnotism, he's going, "What? No, I can't do that. This doesn't work for me. Nope, nope. I don't like that." I mean, so he's talking in like a plain, almost mo- almost monotone way, and yet you're flashbacking to the fucking horrible. Sc- I have goosebumps right this second. I'm fucking freaking out just right now. <laughs> You see, you see, you see the pictures of what he's talking about, and so it's that mix of really scary, spooky stuff, and then normalcy. It's almost like you said walking home and not knowing. I mean, you're walking home in the middle of the day, mm-hmm. but yet there's a the, that that piece where it's just like there's a piece of it that's like that believability part where you're just like, oh, but the guy's sitting on the couch talking very nonchalantly, but his flashbacks that you're you're seeing are fucking horrifying. Right. You know? So, again, that movie just fucking puts me over the edge. And The Fourth Kind is very much like that for me because I believe there's an aspect of, of some truth. Right. And so if there's just one little bit that's true and it's so fucking scary and horrifying, did I spike out the computer because I just went uh, high and maybe, octave? I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wonder. Your balls just, just <laughs> completely dropped off your body. It's just so scary. So, anyways, I'm gonna get a, let me get a drama in here to calm myself down. Oh, this is a classic. You'll love this. Shawshank Redemption. Yeah, that, that and that's is everybody. One of, that's, that's one of mine. No, that's that's, that's probably not. That's it's everybody's top five, isn't it? If you it? don't like it, you're not a human being. You're probably an alien. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to abduct me? Now I have to think about it again. Thanks. Yeah, Shawshank Redemption is one of those movies where you can watch it over and over again. And I don't really understand why I even love it that much. It's a story. It is such well, no shit, a it's good a story. No, but I mean, some it, movies are just, uh, they're stories that their plots aren't that great. Or, Those, you, have, that or movie, you have action movies and, this, and there's really no, no story plot. to it. It's just explosions but and killing. To me, I know people have a problem with Stephen King when his, some people really like his writing, some people don't like his writing. I'm a big fan of his books. But to think of that, he wrote The Green Mile, Shawshank Redemption. I mean, these are really iconic movies yeah, I that are to, loved I by that everybody. Too. You know what? Here, here's, here's a movie that. I don't know if you're going to... No. 
The Emerald Forest. Oh, great movie. Oh, you do know it. River Phoenix, right? I think it's River Phoenix, mm-hmm. Down the Rainforest. Harrison you, Ford's the dad? No. Then I'm thinking of a different movie. Yeah. You are thinking River of a, Forest. yeah, you're thinking of the one Mosquitoes. where River Phoenix, where Harrison, yeah, Mosquito Coast. There you go. Yeah. The Emerald Forest was about this American who goes down to the Amazon, the goes down to the rainforest because oh. they're they're tearing down all these trees and he's got to be there to help build a dam. And what's what's that actor's name? That's the dad. Um, I can't. I, 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 he's, no, I can't. Oh. He was actually. We'll is it iron, he was actually iron, is it Ironside. I don't know, but he was actually. In the last Avenger, he was in the Avengers movie, the first Avengers movie. He Bill was on Markham the, he was on the, the panel. I love that movie because his son is in. The that. son gets up. The son wanders off into the rainforest, and he goes missing. That's it. Period. And and then you and it flashes forward uh, fifteen, fifteen years maybe, and every year that dad has come back to the rainforest. And he spends so many weeks looking for his son. Ugh. He puts on an expedition to look for his son because he believes his son is still alive. Which, in all reality, a kid would be dead in probably seven minutes. They wander into the rainforest. You think so? I mean, no. Just stumble into a viper or stumble oh, into yeah. I mean, something. Yeah, right? but you're not going to last the night. Right. Unless, of course, as a child, that, that in, the, the thing in the movie is this kid is raised by a tribe in the rainforest and they're called the invisible people because they use camouflage this emerald forest they use a special green rock that that they use for camouflage and they they believe if they put this they paint themselves with this nobody can see them so Mm -hmm. they're called the invisible people oh cool yeah i remember that movie i remember seeing that movie theater so that was just one of those movies that i remember and again, for those people who are not old enough to remember this, if you don't know this slogan, is it live or is it Memorex? <laughs> if you don't know that, if you haven't heard that sales pitch before, you're not going to get half of what I'm talking yeah, exactly. about exactly. That's okay, though. It'll help you expand your mind. Yeah. Uh, I have Scent of a Woman as my next one. Again, okay, that's all right. Classic, hilarious, you know funny, I know, I know you serious. like that guy. I know you like that guy, the main actor. Al Pacino? Al Pacino? And I know people think he's an amazing actor. He is an amazing actor. You may not like him. But here, here's the reality of Al Pacino. <laughs> yeah. He says he, every role he's in, every role he's ever been in or ever will be in, I'm sure. I'll put money on it. I got five bucks. I'll put it down. Like I'll put, drop it like it's hot. So my bet is he always does things the exact same way. He 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 yells things that don't need to be yelled. <laughs> he starts screaming. He sounds the exact same way. You look at the character, and you could take you could pluck you could pluck one character out of one of his movies and set it down into a different movie, and it, you would you could take off with it, and it'd be fine. Isn't be that totally part, fine? Isn't that part of the appeal of some actors? I mean, Brad Pitt would be a good example. He's yes. always Brad Pitt, but he's playing a different character, mm-hmm. right? He's, he, he's you don't think that you don't because I mean, when I see Brad Pitt acting, that's what I see is I see him being a stoner in True Romance when he was before he was a big star and he was the exact he, his acting is very similar and he acts the same way but he was just a stoner in that one. And then, see, uh, when I think of a great actor, I think of depth in acting. Okay. Like la, la, I hate to say it, but Robert, Matt, De, Robert De Niro would be a great. I mean, he's mm, different. You don't think he's different in his roles? Yeah, I guess he has been a little bit more than Al Pacino. Pacino. But like, say, Matt Damon. I mean, he just played Verace's gay lover. You don't, you don't have more depth in, a, in an actor as Matt Damon, who played Bourne Supremacy, the Bourne movies, who he's a total badass, right. to the gay lover. <laughs> well, I mean, part of it is I think some of these younger actors really, I would say that probably, I wouldn't say Robert De Niro was ever or I'm sorry, the Al Pacino was ever in a niche kind of thing, I would see the similarities. But I think that um, Matt Damon has a, probably a lot more opportunity movie-wise to do different stuff. He, did he just do that movie Oblivion where he's like part robot to... Yeah. But, I, mean, yeah. I mean, he does play a lot of diverse roles. You yes. know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I can kind of see that. I think, I think, I think Robert De Niro is way up there for me, though. So. Okay, let's, let's kind of... We need to run through these a little bit. Okay, let me, I'm just going to tell you... Do it. 
the ones on my list. So we already talked about Nightmare on Elm Street, but then he got some of the older iconic movies, Top Gun, Karate Kid. Oh, I watched Karate Kid yesterday. We talked about The Matrix. We talked about Mannequin. We talked about Forrest Gump. Stripes. Oh, God, what a good movie. Stripes, Ghostbusters, those uh, Spies Like Us, those were the very my very first interaction with movies that were just so fucking overboard funny. Yeah. Silly. Spies Like Us was so funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're going to put you guys through special training. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> drop them on the ground from a plane. It's and like, and then I have I have I have movies that are directly influenced by my father. Who, uh, if it's not a cowboy movie, it's Mash. Oh, I love. Or that. it better be a cowboy movie. I love Mash. <laughs> so we watched Mash, the TV series, but we also I also loved the movie Mash. Oh, great movie! Because there's a you know they they have the same characters, but they have different actors playing those characters. The Cowboys. Western movie with John John you, Wayne? John Wayne, thank you okay. very fucking Jesus. much. Jeez. <laughs> I wasn't sure we were going that far back. So yeah, long as I... with John Wayne. I'll edit all the other stuff. As long as I have a good and John Wayne. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, maybe, or maybe I'll just leave it. Who knows? Uh, Silverado. Oh, great movie. Great movie. It's got Kevin Costner. No, it's got Kevin, Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein. But yeah, and he's got Kevin Costner in it. Kevin oh, yeah, both of them. Yeah. He plays like the wild, crazy guy. Yeah, the oh, wild, crazy so kid. Oh, he's so good in that. Oh, fuck, that's great. So I love that. Silverado but then great. you, But then I throw in some of the older Bruce Lee movies, The Big <sighs> Boss and Enter and the, the Dragon. Dragon. Mm. And it, that was my first influence with, holy shit, look what, so, how fast somebody can move. Look how, that is amazing. So martial agile. arts? What's martial arts? You know, was, that was my first impact with that type of stuff. And then, of course, you see Chuck Norris in Missing in Action, I think, was right. the name of the movie. And then, of course, I, I went, I go into kind of my fantasy stuff is uh, Interview with a Vampire. Great one. Superman, the original with Christopher Reeves. Oh, good one. I love that. I love that movie so that movie so much. I watched it when I got a boombox. With the, you remember the boomboxes with the two inch by two inch television, black and white television. <laughs> yeah. I actually, the, while the rest of my family are watching Superman downstairs on a big screen color TV, I'm in my room <laughs> Christmas night because I just opened that up because it was my Christmas present. I open that up and I'm watching Superman on two inch by two inch black and white. <laughs> fuzzy with your antennas my fucking head i just have a huge headache i'm sure yeah with the antenna pushed up so that i can get good reception that's so stupid uh but uh wolverine origins now that we're getting into superhero type stuff yeah i remember the first laser disc i the ever big, saw humongous ones the big humongous fucking ones yeah. i were was they bigger than they were bigger than a they record were weren't huge. they huge yeah they, well yeah, they were probably They're about a the size bit. of a record, okay. I think. But the but, thing uh, of that and a compact disc, it's just like... Crawl. Oh, Do you remember God, Crawl? Yeah. Was that, did he have the thing that, that he thing could that, throw? And it ching, was like a throwing star all of a sudden. Ching, yeah. And he'd throw it. And, oh, I yeah. remember that. And it would come back to him like a, almost like a boomerang. Yeah. So I, that was like my first laser disc one that I saw. Here's one. I don't know if you ever saw this. The Last Dragon with Bruce Leroy. Oh, yeah. I have the DVD at home. I've made my Do kids you watch really? it. Fuck. Are you kidding me? The glow? I mean, there's rap in that. There's all yeah. kinds. And I love the little teeny weeny little Asian kid that's in that movie. Who just does, kicks ass. Who just is fucking awesome. And I think the, the kid who plays the main character in that is phenomenal. The singer in it, what's her name? The main singer in that is... I don't know, but she, I thought she became like a born-again Christian, didn't she? She did, but she's one of Prince's girls. So he is one who kind of found her. Because oh, okay. I think her, she has like one of those one-word names that he gave her and shit like that. But, oh, dude. Fucking love that. I loved that I'm movie. I'm going to peel you like a banana. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I and he doesn't even react until somebody touches him and then boom. Yeah. Oh, I, I loved it. love that movie. It starts out with him flipping around you and jumping on. the last dragon. Oh, my God. You He's got me jumping all around excited now. And landing on workout dummies. He's punching things, and his sensei is shooting arrows, and he's wham! He's karate chopping through all these different arrows, and then he finally catches the golden one or whatever it was, yeah. and that's when he knew he was the one, or his master did. Anyway, funny fucking story. 
because of that because of this movie this is why it has left such an impact on me two things really two things one funny one not so funny Let's go with the not so funny first, and we'll end on a good note. Oh, do I get to finish my fucking list, or are we? Only yeah, doing I'm going to end my thing on a good Jesus note. Jesus Christ! Okay, first thing, <laughs> the not so funny thing. Uh, in that movie, The Last Dragon, they have kind of like uh, this balding, gap-toothed actor who's kind of like a um, a loan shark, and he's and he's the little teeny guy, the little teeny guy who's got the gun. He's yeah. the main bad guy. Yeah. Well, he's his girlfriend is doing like a m- music video. Right. You watch that movie. You watch that music video that she's doing. It is so fucking terrible. Right. But that would be a popular song today. You think so? Yes. When I think back to that movie, it was like it's about her boo, like my headlights or something like that. She had yeah, like headlight boobs. It it's like Katy Perry. You you wa- <laughs> yeah. Well, you watch that and you think huh. that, that could actually be out today and that would be popular. popular. But when I watched that, when anybody watched it back then, it was ridiculous. You watched it and you thought that is so pathetic and stupid. Right. You don't that, like you don't like the Wrecking Ball video with Miley Cyrus. It it. To me, it bothers me when, when even as a child, you saw something and you thought, this is stupid, this is ridiculous, this yeah. is a total comedy. But then you take that, and it is actual reality today. What right. does that say about us? Okay, that was my serious thing. I'll get off of it. Here's the funny story. Because <laughs> I really want to keep this like, kind of lighthearted. <laughs> Here's the funny story. So in that movie... The main bad guy. Mm-hmm. He says to Bruce, "Show Lee, enough, show enough, love it. Who am I? Show enough." <laughs> <laughs> he In says the football to, pads. The yeah, yeah, football, with pads. The football pads. Great yeah. stuff. But he says to Bruce Leroy, "Leroy, <laughs> I got something for your ass in these hands." He's got the hands that glow, the glow, yeah. and he's got. They're sparking. I got something for your ass in these hands, right? <laughs> right? So one night I get off the bus and my best friend decides he's going to pick a fight with somebody. And what does he say to him? <laughs> I got something for your ass in these hands. <laughs> and the other kid just... And the other kid wrecked him. <laughs> <laughs> The other kid didn't run? <laughs> no. There was no glow. That was what the 80s movies did to us. The 80s movies made us think that if I hold a boombox above my head the girl outside like a girl's window, I'll get the girl. Or if I say, I got something for your ass in these hands, then well, I, will actually, wow, I will actually win the fight. That is... It could not be further from the truth. Oh, God. That's that shit sure. is not going to happen. Let me finish my last... Because I have to send up... I have... I have I'm for Red October. Yeah. Pretty good. Um, Life as a House. Oh, yeah. Very good movie. I Kevin like Klein, yeah. again. Wonderful Kevin movie. Klein. Forrest Gump's on there. Uh, Stand By Me. That's one good. of my absolute Very favorites. Good. And then Philadelphia is in my top ten of movies. Just the, those, the oh, Tom really? Hanks dramatic. He got Academy. That's his first Academy Award. Okay. There are just scenes in that movie. Well, because... Um, who is the uh, Antonio Banderas? No, that was his. I just like saying his, his name like I Banderas. Banderas. Uh, but no, who is the lawyer who is helping him? Denzel Washington. There's a scene where he's he's getting an IV and he's he's talking about there's a opera he plays an opera and Denzel Washington is sitting on a couch and this, the opera I think is in Italian and so um, Tom Hanks is walking around with this IV in his living room and he's. As the music is singing in this opera, he's telling Denzel Washington, and now she's saying that, why would you do this to me? And you can see you're hearing her voice or his voice in the background while he's explaining the opera to Denzel Washington. And Denzel Washington's just kind of sitting there with his head in his hand, just enraptured by what he's saying. It's just an extremely dramatic scene in the movie that really is buried in my head. I want to say really quick that two movies that I didn't have in my top ten because I was doing drama, dramatic ones and not yeah. comedies. What about Bob? Is sure. a family classic. We watch it probably once a month, yeah, at least. I, I bet you're at say, least once a month. You I, gotta watch I bet it. I know what you're gonna say next. You do now because we're too we're too close friends. <laughs> so I married an axe murder. murder. Yeah. Again, these two movies. So and I should probably put Love Actually up there because Love Actually. What about Bob and So I Married an Axe Murder? 
is going to be on my television at some point every month. It's almost, we don't plan on it. It's just like if it's a rainy day outside, you got nothing to do, perfect time for it to snuggle on the couch and watch Love Actually. But if you're in a goofy move, move, mood, you want to watch What About Bob, you know, ahoy, I'm sailing. I mean, you can't, there's no, it doesn't do anything but lift your spirits to watch Bill Murray as What About Bob. And I just think that So I Married an Axe Murder is one of those underground, you know, cult classics that people always talk about, oh, I fucking love that movie, and yet it didn't do anything in the movie theaters. It was know, not popular in the movie by any stretch of I the imagination. Loved, I loved grunge, the grunge era, of the Seattle grunge era, uh, era yeah. of music. And that movie, that movie obviously is in Seattle. What movie? It's based out of, no, San Francisco. San Francisco. Sorry. It's based out of San Francisco. But it reminds me so strongly of that grunge time period. Has some alternative music in it and stuff the like that. The coffee shops, the Ramones, the heavy coffee, and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, so. I can see that. But I mean, to me, I, 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 my kids don't really get. So I married an axe murderer very much. It's more something that as adults can really laugh at, you know. And he bust but, into the <laughs> bitch's ocular cavities. <laughs> this way to the cafeteria. <laughs> God, that 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 guy right there, that comedian. Oh yeah, is it Phil Hart? Phil Hartman. Phil, Phil Hartman. Joe he, Rogan talks about that. What it was like at that that sitcom they were all doing together about the radio station after yes. he died. How hard that was to to move past he, it. It didn't last very much longer. He was one of those. He was one of those comedians that so unique. Yeah, his dr- the dry the dryness of his delivery, the dryness of his lines that he sold it. So well. Or how about when he did Frankenstein on Saturday Night Live? I know Live. you love the. I, knew, I was thinking Frankenstein. Because he, he, didn't, he didn't have lines. He made noises, and it was fucking a riot. Yeah. But yeah, he was great. And so I, so I married an axe murderer. Just fantastic in that movie. But what about Bob? I mean, I just never stopped laughing in that movie. This, every time, you know, dead hands. You know, just when he's going through all of his symptoms. It's just like, <laughs> you know, I treat people like telephones. This one's just not. This one's just out of order right now. <laughs> it's like, oh my god! It's just some of the, the the writing in that is so funny, and you couldn't find two more opposite people than Dr. Leo Marvin and uh, <laughs> and Bob <laughs> Gill. Good morning, Gill. Sorry, gotta go to work. Turns around his chair and punches his time card at the desk behind him. Oh Christ Almighty! That's just too funny. Love it. I'm gonna go home and watch it right now. As a matter of fact, awesome. All right. Well, hey. <laughs> What a nice turn of events here on the primal screen. I hope people liked it. It wasn't quite yeah. as dark and deep as it usually gets. I mean, sometimes. we started out so. with some current events, and that was kind of, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully people didn't start listening to it and go, oh, fuck, they're talking politics again. <laughs> I'm turning this. For once, we went lighthearted. Yeah. But, hey, really quick, I want to do a couple of really quick shout-outs um, to people, places, businesses that have really helped us and who I really believe in, okay? One, one business here in the Iowa, Cedar Rapids area is Hard Drive MMA. Hard Drive MMA, really like what they're doing down there. I really want to be a part of it, and I'm going to go down and take some classes. Really has motivated me to do more stuff for myself, okay? Awesome. Keone Coke, and you'll see um, he's the owner or, or uh, co-owner. I don't, I'm not even sure. He's the owner. <clears throat> of hard drive. So I'll have a link up to his website on, on our page. Also, Guitar Center. Guitar Center in the area, who they've been helping us. I am a total, I have been a total novice walking into this experiment, this podcast experiment, and buying equipment <laughs> and coming in and asking questions about the equipment and then taking the equipment back, and then buying something else, and then taking that equipment back, and then trying something else, and then going back to the equipment I had before. And every time you had a and question, every, they answered it for yeah, you. Every I mean, single just... time I went in there, they were positive, they were helpful, they never made me feel stupid, they, had, they made me feel like they had all the time in the world to help me. So the customer service at Guitar Center was the best. It, it was it was. It was customer service that I thought was gone. It was from, and if you from think about life. it, with the amount of, of money we've spent getting the podcast ready to go and just function right, they could have really raked us over the coals. Oh, if they sure. They could have been like, oh, no. Nope, you're not returning that. Yeah, or no, this is the mic you want. It's $150. 
You know True. what I mean? You yeah. can do that too. Exactly. I mean, they could really, it's, instead of saying, hey, that's awesome, good for you guys, here's the best thing they had to start out with. Yeah, I returned know? something the other day, and uh, the manager came back, and she goes, did you activate the software? And I said, oh, yeah, I did. She goes, okay, um, before you can return this and get a full refund, I need to call Personas and I need to talk to their customer support, and I need them to deactivate your activation so that when we sell this to somebody else, they can activate this. And I'm like, okay. She was on the fucking phone for a half hour. Really? She was on the phone for a half hour for me, the guy who bought something who didn't understand what he was buying, and she helped me out, and she had a smile on her face when she got off the phone, and, she, and I apologized for having put her through that. And she goes, oh, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you out. That's awesome. Yeah. Great customer service, Guitar Center. So thank you guys very much out there. And I know that some of you are listening from Guitar Center because while I was waiting, while she was on the phone and we were all waiting. <laughs> You're promoting this, the shit out of it. I was promoting the shit out of the podcast. So <laughs> thank you very much for all the help at Guitar Center. And hey, Todd, how can people follow us? You can go to our webpage. That's probably the best place to start. Go to theprimalscream.org. That is O-R-G. And um, you can like us on Facebook. Please do that and comment like crazy. We try to keep up on Facebook. You probably can uh, find us better if you follow us on Twitter because we tweet all the time and retweet stuff all the time. As you know, Dad, pat me on the back. I'm doing a better job of tweeting. And then um, <laughs> also make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes. That's the best way to get it. It'll automatically download uh, each month as we get it, or sorry, each week as you get a new podcast from us. We're trying to be consistent about that. Also on Pinterest. I've been enjoying doing a lot of Pinterest stuff, and I'm going to start an MMA page, I think. I decided that it would be cool to see if we can put some hard drive videos on there and some cool things like kettlebell shit and stuff like that. Um, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of us. And Listen, we really, really appreciate it. Besides the businesses that are out there supporting us, we want to thank you guys as well for downloading the podcast and, and, and making this, uh, this experiment, which is a great word for it, Surprise us every day that it's that it's popular and it's it's getting more popular and people are liking it. It just it makes us feel good. It's, yeah. it's a it's a it's a wonderful thing to to have a community that you can just talk to and bullshit with and, and they're and they're down with it. It's, it's it's really a good feeling. Yeah, and we have more to offer. So stick with us. Continue listening. We are going to have some really awesome guests coming up. Yeah, uh, we have some musicians that we're going to get. In, we're going to be getting scheduled. We have some more MMA guys coming on. <laughs> we have some it, artists. We have some people who do art in the local area that are going to be on as well. That'll be exciting. A local author is going to be coming on. I mean, we have people of vastly different <laughs> occupations. And you know what? If you want to hear about something or you want to stir up conversation, think of this show as your water cooler. Send us a comment. Ask us a question. Send us a subject if you want to hear something more about it or if you want our opinions on something. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times Rock has said, hey, watch this video and let's talk about it. And then we, look at the, we watch the video and we're like, shit, yeah, let's do it. And if we hadn't listened to him, we wouldn't know a thing about Sam Harris. That's right. You know what and, I mean? And if you wouldn't have li- watched the uh, Lloyd Pye video, you wouldn't have known anything about 20-inch pygmies. That's right. <laughs> Which, what else is better than 20-inch pygmies? <laughs> Nothing better than a 20-inch pygmy story. <laughs> so, hey, have a great night, everybody. Thank you for listening to the podcast and stay tuned for further podcasts. Oh, we really appreciate yeah. you. Very much so. All right. So we'll talk to you later. Adios. Peace.